OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. All right, you're welcome along. It's Thursday morning, it's OTB AM, and we're here all the way through until 10 o'clock. Kathleen is here. Kathleen, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. Shane is here. Shane, how are you? One of them, things. It's uh, It's not Jose Mourinho's world, it turns out. Anything but Jose. So, in the build-up to this game, Jose Mourinho was talking about how he is going to end up potentially at Real Madrid or Paris Saint-Germain. If you are involved with Real Madrid or Paris Saint-Germain, and you're watching the football last night, and the aftermath of the game... And you choose Jose Mourinho as the manager of your pristine, precious jewel of a club. Well, then you deserve everything that's coming for you. Oh, it was a farce last night. I sat down to watch the Europa League final. I was like, this is going to be exciting. Jose against uh, the uh, experts of the Europa League in Sevilla. The build-up was so good as well. Like, the atmosphere looked class, the fans. Yeah. Oh, and... everything was perfect. Set up perfectly for a brilliant game. It, like, it was an exciting game for some parts, but then it just tapered off into this farcical yellow card extravaganza where Anthony Taylor was, I don't know, probably having the the, the scariest night of his life. Um, Michael Oliver as fourth official, probably the busiest night of his fourth official career. Uh, it was just one of those nights where you're just like, this is insanity. They're, they're on the bench remonstrating every single tiny minuscule decision um, and, and the yellow cards being thrown around uh, like willy nilly it was just was there seven yellow cards on the bench there was maybe 13 or 14 yellow cards in the game and all it was like and then of course at the end of extra time um, Roma feel Eric Lamella should have been given a second yellow for a foul that led to a free kick Lamella is let off he ends up taking and scoring a penalty in the shootout for, for Sevilla so look maybe that one you could argue was a wrong decision but overall I actually felt Anthony Taylor handled what was a really difficult night reasonably well I don't think I would have had the patience or composure that he had I didn't have the patience for the game so I dipped in and out and I, I saw when he was given the yellow card to Mancini and it looked <laughs> to me a little bit like Taylor had lost the run of himself he was screaming at him to come over to him, come over to him, and then he gave him a warning and then immediately gave him a booking when there was just the next entanglement. And you're like, I mean, yeah. you know, like, it, you just feel a little bit... And then maybe he maybe he regained his composure and he wasn't chasing players around and, and shouting at them. No, I thought, like... I didn't think considering. so. Like, considering how much Mourinho was at him, calling him over every single foul that happened. It actually turned into a bit of a joke when I was watching it, like, how many times is the camera going to flash over to the bench and Mourinho and everyone's just... It was almost like a little Mexican wave. They just all, like, rise together and run straight for the line. But I thought, considering how much fouling was going on, Taylor did relatively well. Like, he had so much to keep him busy. And he he did lose it like once or twice with players when they weren't listening to him, but it wasn't like a thing that lasted for the whole game. Mm. You know, he kind of got himself back under control. They all just sort of stopped playing football and just had a competition as to who could roll around and like act oh. the most hurt and injured. It would have been a better watch. Like, like it was such a terrible game by the end of it extra time was a phony war like at the end it was like do you know in Gaelic, Gaelic football or hurling where especially Gaelic football where a team gets a black card and for that 10 minute period they consistently go down and have their little fouls because the time no. was stop. I know of course what? I know you'd believe, no. you wouldn't believe it would you not the true Irish Gales no no they would never no do cheating that. here uh, but that that's felt like extra time it felt like both teams were a, a black card Gaelic football team and they were just like passing the ball back and forth going down injured Nemanja Madic must have had 53 cramps like he just kept going and the man only came on like one, one for every time. muscle in his body he was unbelievably cramped um, but it was just it was insane the gesturing from Mourinho like the stat came up last night he shared five European titles a record with Giovanni Trapattoni the only other manager who has five European titles trying to get to six uh, gets his, his runners up medal after the match and does his usual thing walks away, well away from his uh, Roma players throws the, the medal into the crowd <laughs> so someone sitting at home it's probably sitting on eBay right now but uh, that's the thing because like the Roma fans love him like they worship him yeah. they like feel they're so lucky that the fact that they got a manager of Mourinho's calibre or at least with his general CV to actually come 
to them and like take over the team and I was reading a couple of pieces ahead of the game yesterday of like different journalists who were based in the city ahead of the game and like talking to fans and it was just like all hail the king basically Caesar, which is mad yeah, yeah like all the fans were just like he can do whatever he wants we don't care but, and then at the end of the shootout you're like this another moment of controversy that probably added to Jose is that Montiel the Argentinian takes the, the penalty for Sevilla to win it misses or rather it's saved by Rui Patricio and then they're like take that again there will you oh. encroachment by Rui Patricio um, and if you look back at it it probably was encroachment it's the encroachment these days like it, sometimes they're basically right in front of the penalty taker that's how close to yeah. they get and it's, it's so blatant and obvious you have to give it <laughs> this one wasn't blatant and obvious but was it not but no okay. but if you look back on VAR when the ball is kicked oh poor Jose it's yeah. really unfortunate that they, they use the rules against him isn't it <laughs> I wonder what pro- provoked everybody to like follow their law yeah and then very letter that was insanity just to piss him off by the way Montiel scored the winning penalty in the World Cup final shootout in December and now he scored the, scores the winning penalty once he retook it give him the Ballon d'Or now yep. Shane is what I hear you say nobody top. has done that ever in history no 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 uh, top level penalties but uh, it was battle of the defences for, for large swathes of the game uh, weirdly enjoyed it at par- in parts until it got to extra time and I was like no 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 this is actually well before extra time to be fair is that, uh, like the first half was fine yeah. And then after that was <laughs> awful. Yeah, I think and then when Sevilla equalised, they looked like the more likely team for like twenty minutes. Uh, mm-hmm. They just couldn't. They couldn't get the ball in the head again. Very rarely that I sit and watch a game and I'm like, why am I pushing myself through this? I was like, I could be do- I could be learning a new skill right now. I could be doing something actually worthwhile with my time. But <laughs> you're somehow entranced. I think whatever it is about Mourinho, you just don't know what's gonna happen and you're like, Oh yeah, I'll sit this, I'll put myself through this just to see what he does. And I don't want that for my life anymore. I don't want it's fine for like one match a season and I'll do that but if he comes anywhere back towards the football that I watch regularly it's it's going to upset me massively yeah if you could stay out of the Champions League that'd be great if uh, Paris Saint-Germain please paying attention this is not what you need for your club although maybe they're looking at that going oh, imagine everybody acting in concert and caring about it enough everybody seems to care about the result here yeah we could do with a little bit of that but if people have seen the uh, the, the clip that's gone reasonably viral after the match of, of Mourinho confronting Anthony Taylor as he presumably heads towards his, his shuttle bus or taxi or it's in a random car park like yeah underneath the stadium and, and like he uh, so he calls him an effing disgrace bullshit decisions he in the press conference accused him of steaming Spanish um, for his decisions it reminded me of the attack on Khabib uh, yeah all, all it was missing was the throwing of the thing yeah 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 100% completely at it like either it's it's totally calculated for some reason like he wants to go down as an absolute legend in the eyes of the Roma fans and he thinks this is the way to do it or he's completely lost control and either way you expect this is like a significant ban from the touchline you'd mm-hmm. imagine European football which you hope again has an impact on whether or not any of the super clubs are interested in taking him back but like it's all about him today and Sevilla have just won you know yeah. I, I, as you were pointing out the third manager of the season it's incredible Oh, the turnaround since March has been insane. Like, they were just outside the La Liga relegation zone. I think they're up to seventh now. Um, They've only lost two games in 11, and now they've just won a European title. Like, that's some turnaround. They're unbelievable in Europe. Like, because you look at the start of their season and they were absolutely putrid. Relegation was actually a possibility for Sevilla at one point. And uh, the fact that they've managed to go on and they beat Manchester United, then they beat Juventus, and now they've beaten Roma. Like, they, they've, they've won the Europa League the hard way. That's not an easy, an easy run to the title either. But, yeah, Jose takes the headlines. And it felt like that scene afterwards, it felt like... I feel like Vince McMahon was going to walk out. I felt like WWE, mm. a stage, almost staged wrestling kind of um, attack on Anthony Taylor. You don't, ha- you don't ever see Anthony Taylor in the clip, but you know he's he's there somewhere in the background, and maybe the officials are walking out. But even before like the result last night, like John Bruin's going to be on the show a little bit later on to talk about the game and also Mourinho. And even before that, like I was chatting to him, and I think it was, they think the game was draw at that stage, and he was like, it's it's going to be a Mourinho theme. He was like, no matter what happens in this game. 
all anyone is going to be talking about tomorrow morning is Mourinho. And it's right. Like, you look at all the papers, all the headlines, it's Mourinho, and there's like maybe a paragraph or a couple of lines dedicated to Sevilla and the incredible feat that they've achieved. Mm. And the rest is just like the cult of Mourinho and what he has done. I, I weirdly found myself, like Stockholm Syndrome or something, I found myself at the start of the match supporting Rooting for him. I, I was rooting for him. I was like, I, I want this. because. But yeah. then you remembered what he did to you. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But he hadn't even conceded a goal in one, any of his European European final since Henrik Larsson in, in 03 like ever so like that own goal for the Sevilla goal you're like oh this is this is history it does it does it does remind us all what was Daniel Levy doing no, no, I mean did he feel like was there a bonus associated with winning the trophy was there like a, a clause that kicked in the contract that there was an extra year and so the compensation would have been more well, I don't understand like mm. the, the, the decision to turn down the opportunity to win the trophy with Mourinho granted they might still have lost with him but yeah. they had a much better chance than they did without him um, we should move on because the other big manager story is that Ange and Spurs now uh, before the Celtic fans get too worried Spurs have literally been linked with every available top quality manager in world football over the last four months and not a single one of them <laughs> has bitten beyond uh, having conversations and thinking well, this doesn't really sound like a good deal it feels like there are a lot of strings attached and the baggage seems to be weighing everybody in the room down literally and metaphorically and so yet there's enough here where it feels like there's no smoke without fire that Ange's Ange's camp seem to be allowing this to happen that the interest is bubbling up perhaps Ange is using this as a, a means to provoke the Celtic owner to back the club with more money and more ambition I mean they do have one of the best uh, I don't know he seems like a very 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 good manager and to lose him now would seem like carelessness I know well, I'm sorry go on Kathleen I was going to say as much as like Spurs have been linked with every manager Ange has also been linked with every single job that's come up and most of them it's kind of just because he of the success he's had with Celtic whereas this feels like the first time there's actually like proper reports that he's in talks with Spurs which makes me think that there's a little bit more to it than possibly other mm. like which they, they were linked with Roberto De Zerbi they were linked with Marco Silva they were linked with Arne Slot who of course last week said he's staying with Feyenoord well, so Luis Enrique if you follow Enrique. if you follow the, the train through though they were linked with Nagelsmann and they, they mm. continued to be linked with him until it emerged that he didn't want to go or that talks had broken down. With Slot, he was linked for ages and there was no denial for ages until he said he was staying where he was. Apparently, the money was incorrect or some, something, uh, the, the transfer fee that Feyenoord wanted was shocked Spurs. With this, there's been a slight bubble up but there's no, there's been no report yet from Celtic saying that's not going to happen. It, uh, Celtic are bracing themselves for an official approach to come after the cup final. Like the approach would only come if Spurs feel like if they've been given comfort somewhere along the way uh, by an advisor or something. That yeah, yeah, if you do that now, I think that might make sense. Yeah, the reports in the papers today seem to be that they're not going to approach him until after Celtic play Inverness, Cali Thistle in that cup final on Saturday, but. I mean, you'd imagine they'll have... That's not... I don't... No. You know. They'll have open negotiations before then. It's lying season. Yeah, of course. Of course, so. everyone's lying. But if you're Ange, I really, really hope he doesn't do this. Don't do this, Ange, if you're watching. I mean, that, you said it this morning, Kathleen, it, it, it has the stench of Potter to Chelsea of it, mm. where eventually, a few months in, he's going to regret and go, oh, I had a good thing. I had such a good thing at Celtic. Could have waited another six months, maybe a year, won another treble up in Scotland, and then moved on. Like, his, 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 his star is not going to go down in Scotland, let's be honest. Like, it's, it's going to stay either where it is or go higher, so... I think everyone expects him to move on at some stage and get you know a decent job but I just don't know what going to Spurs with this current team what he's going to be able to do and like to be fair maybe he'll go in and he'll be the first person to actually talk Daniel Levy around and build the team that he wants in the same way he's done with Celtic and we could all be eating our words in a year's time but it just it's the sort of club where you don't have control in the same way that if you go to Chelsea you don't have control because of the looming large of a character like Daniel Levy and 
whoever does go in there either needs to be very, very certain in themselves and able to stand up for themselves. And I kind of feel like maybe you need a bit more of a portfolio is wrong because like obviously Ange has achieved quite a bit so far but I just feel like you need a bit more European success and a bit more of that sort of back end to be able to go into Spurs and actually achieve what you want to achieve I do think the Spurs job is a good job personally I think that um, because of the, the stadium and the match day income which we keep hearing about um, the playing squad you know the way the playing squad at Man United was so oh this is horrific we, no one could ever make this work and then all of a sudden a grown up comes in the room mm. and things improve immediately so some of those players who were playing badly this year for Spurs under Ange could actually play well his style of football is going to get the Spurs fans on on board straight away like do you if you're if you're Ange and you know that there's the strong likelihood that Harry Kane's going to leave, do you convince him to stay for one season and score another thirty goals, and then you've got Kane and Son playing Ange ball? I don't know. I think I think like um, how many opportunities is Ange going to get? Like what what other top six, top eight clubs in England are there? There's the City job, right? Which you know he has been part of the Manchester City. Um, uh, what do you call it? What are, what are all the millions of clubs that they own? Um, so they do know him and they are aware of Ange's uh, characteristics as a manager. And so it wouldn't be, it's not beyond the band's possibility that he gets talked about as a potential city, um, city boss. It's unlikely though. It feels like a, it's unlikely that they would take somebody from Celtic to take over from Guardiola. I don't know. Well, but after that, the Liverpool job, is he, maybe he's a candidate for the Liverpool job? Liverpool fits Liverpool fits his mould better like so and just positives he, he unbelievable in transfers knowledge of the Japanese market clearly with the players he's brought into Celtic his man management apparently he fist bumps all the colleagues one of these usual stories every morning coming into the training ground everybody likes him um, tactical tactical nous as well but then you look at his European record it's, it's very poor um, the the quality of football in Scottish in Scotland let's be honest doesn't lead us much in terms of uh, it doesn't tell us where he's at as a manager um, and there are other negatives no sign of guaranteed success in like the Premier League there's not and there's also he, he specifically asked not to have a director of football at Celtic because he doesn't like working under someone Daniel Levy I mean the shadow of Daniel Levy over him is not something Ange wants I, 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 I don't see any truth to that. Could be a red face now next week when he signs the contract in Tottenham. But so, but if you're if you're in Camp Ange, right? Uh, what job are you waiting for? What what mythical job in the future are you waiting for? Well, the Man United job is not coming available. No. The Liverpool job is unlikely to come available. For, it might do. You know, Klopp might burn out, and maybe at the end of next season, Pep might win the Champions League and decides there's no more Everest for me to climb. And I'm stinking rich, and you know, uh, there's the potential for us to be a championship club for a season uh, unlikely but it's a possibility so those three unlikely uh, after that who are you looking at the Chelsea job just signed Pochettino to a three year deal mm. more than likely he sees out two of those years more than likely yeah. um, after that Arsenal not going to happen so where the Spurs job might be the best available job in England over the next three seasons yeah uh, like the advice uh, you just wait don't you like if you're for what though for a better job than this what, what's the better job well, sh- well maybe say the Liverpool give me the job, job. Come on, I've just listed I've listed every club in the world hey, football say, there Shane say 6 to 12 months Liverpool job comes up uh, Ange does not develop young players by the way like he Celtic have an unbelievable academy and he do they have an unbelievable academy well, they have a lot of players who are very hyped yeah well they have a strong academy I would say do but, they have a strong academy well we don't know because Ange doesn't bring them in well that's that. Well, then they're not good enough but the, the, I remember Tom English was on with this a number of months ago and he said there is a decent crop of young Celtic players that just can't get a chance under Ange there's a bit of a Mourinho about him in terms of he's not he, he uses the players that are there he buys players in from Japan and elsewhere uh, I don't know if it fits at Spurs like it just to me looks like something that's going to go badly wrong within the first six months and and I think Ange is a brilliant manager I just think the Spurs job I know you say it's a, it's a good job of course it is it'll be good money it's a brilliant stadium and all the rest and you've they've a decent got, team they've got like one of the best players in world football and Harry Kane on their team well, he might be gone this summer he might be gone but maybe Ange comes down and goes you're the man and we're going to break all the records and we're going to we're going to win a Champions League here he's heard it all before Kane hasn't he yeah but not Promises. from somebody credible like I don't know what the conversation was like with Antonio Conte he probably thought Conte was credible when he was coming in but like if you're Harry Kane this summer and again Kane dominates the back pages morning after morning this summer but he's, he has to leave to, to win a trophy um, uh, 
I don't know what. Being I'm successful stable. in Scotland, says Shane, doesn't guarantee success in the Premier League as we've previously seen. Won't last one season if he moves to Spurs. Uh, why wouldn't he go to Spurs? Ambition has never been as low, so less pressure, says John Claffey. Spurs is a basket case, but it's not Chelsea, says Seabrack, and I think he's capable of doing a job there. Big question for me is the squad. Again, here's the thing. If you're Ange and you know the squad, you're like, well, that guy clearly underperforming by about 40%. I'll get that 40% out of him. And suddenly we have players who are more than capable of holding their own in the top six in the Premier League. And then all of a sudden it's a good season. Yeah, that point that point that John Claffey makes uh, ambition never been as low at Spurs, so there's less pressure. That maybe that's an argument for the Spurs position. Like it literally couldn't be worse at the moment. Like they're not in European football for next season. Uh, he does a bad record in Europe anyway, so maybe get them to Europe and then a year later develop them. I don't know. If Andrew does go to Spurs, Jared, like what do you think he'll be given the time to develop the team in the way that he likes to and there'll be the patience there? Well, to let him have the time and space. Yeah, I think there will. Really, I think there's there's going to be an acceptance the next time that the manager has to not be a Jose style or a Conte style, and that they're going back to the Pochettino point where they gave him a period of time. Now, if memory serves, he was good out the gate at Spurs. Um, I do think that he has a style of play that will immediately get the Spurs fans on board in a way that some of the managers recently haven't. Uh, check out um, check out the, the goalkeeper from Wolves who was like, uh, what, are, what are we doing here? Why are we signing this guy? Um, so I, like, I genuinely do think that there's a good chance that he's successful early. There's no European football for him to worry about. So he plays his best team week in, week out, which means the small squad is not that bad uh, a problem for him. The not developing young players, like I think everybody thinks that, as Wenger said, they've got the prettiest wife. Everybody thinks the kids coming through next. Well, they're the generation that are going to save us and change football. But like, who is brilliant at bringing through young players? Like, give me the world manager who manages a, a super club at the moment who's like got a long track record of bringing players into the team who then go on and have 5, 10, 15 year careers and like if we're looking at Man City they've bought all the best young talent in the world and spent the most money on their academy in the world and so therefore they have Phil Foden but like who else come through into that team? Yeah well like Arteta's done it Arteta's brought through young players uh, Alex Ferguson did it like it, it can Arteta work. probably needs more time though. To Alex Ferguson is a little bit of an outlier there, Shane. Yeah, but, but a little it, bit of an outlier. I'm not saying that that Ange needs to at Celtic bring through ten academy players into the first team every season, but but blood a few of them in. They're just oh, what if they're shite? Well, then then you have Whose to. Whose fault is that? Well, <laughs> Celtic's fault, obviously. They're exactly. Yeah, like I don't know. Uh, so, in one case, you're saying he's too good for for Spurs, and then on the other, you're saying, oh, but look at all these these ugly parts to his his he, ability. Yeah, but he's t- he took as in. The Spurs job and everything off the pitch, like the the the, the crap that comes with working with Daniel Levy, it, it appears, is not worth it. Surely, uh, I also think this summer going to Spurs when Harry Kane appears to be out the door. Now, the the argument for it, and I'm not trying to talk myself into it, but the argument for Ange to Spurs is that he's a great man manager. Look look at the state of those Spurs players. Some of them need look like they just need a hug, and and Ange would give them a hug. And he'll yeah. give them a fist bump, and they'll all be happy. Uh, and yeah, they'll exactly. <laughs> win the Premier League. <laughs> Rory Dunhu, what's going on? Celtic manager for Liverpool FC. Seriously, uh, well, we'll see, Rory. We'll see what, what the the shortlist for uh, Brendan, Rod- manager, Brendan Rogers. Anyone? Selling manager, manager for Liverpool FC. The next manager first. at um, Liverpool is going to be interesting. Conor Joyce says clearly he'll take the Spurs job if it's offered to him because he has a brain unlike some other people. I don't know who you're talking about here, Conor. <laughs> Shots fired. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is our WhatsApp number. If you want to get in touch with us, you can also get us uh, at Off the Ball AM OTBM live with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shape or your money back. Neon Nut Edition is available now. Uh, was there anything else that you guys want to talk about here at the top, just to fill in what's going on? Uh, well, a lot of good GA action at the weekend. There's, there's two. Like, have you seen the fixtures? Like, it's just how are you supposed to keep up? Like I feel a, like Shane. Every so often, me and you just have a conversation in the office, and we're like, "Jesus, the fixtures are great." Jesus, this weekend. Some weekend, this weekend. <laughs> so right. So tomorrow, no, tomorrow's not Saturday. Saturday, you've got the the groups round two: Cork, Kerry at three o'clock, Westmeath, Galway at five, Kildare, Dublin at five, Tyrone, Armagh at seven. Not to mention the four games in the Tottenham Cup that day, um, and then on Sunday. Four more games in the All Ireland groups. You've got Mayo Lowe the two, Monaghan Clare at two. I'll be at that game myself and Clonus. Roscommon Sligo at three, and Donegal Derry at four. And then four more Tottenham Cup games. I mean, that's not to mention the All Ireland Under Twenty hurling final on Sunday as well between Cork and Offaly. 
the minors as well a, a couple of other hurling finals on Saturday there's a lot there's a lot going on but I'll tell you what I do love the, the nature of some of these fixtures like I'm going to Mon and Clare on Sunday and it's like they've never met before in the championship this is novelty stuff which you probably wouldn't get if there was less games like when when are Monon and Clare ever going to play each other in a championship only under a, a, a structure like this but um, that's not to say the structure is perfect by any stretch uh, namely because you can what draw your first game lose the following two and yeah, still then, make the then, preliminary group but then you're going to get hammered it doesn't really matter like it, the point of that is that um, you have something to fight for in your last game which adds significant jeopardy to that game and we, we all know you're going to get hammered like it's not like you're going to go and win the All-Ireland having so I don't know every, like oh look at this thing that I found that oh it's in a terrible a bad team can make it through those bad teams used to end up in All-Ireland quarterfinals actual quarterfinals getting hockeyed by a good team at least now they've had the chance to build for next season and you know I'm sorry this is, I'm not arguing you, you here no. there was a piece yesterday in the paper and I was like oh my god yeah grand like anyway but has so say everyone was like oh Westmead don't have a hope in the in the group phase this year I didn't think they did because their form is their form is terrible but then look at them against Armagh in, sorry in Armagh as well excellent and like I really hope they put a performance together against Galway and they're still somehow alive going into the, the last one of that and like I don't know if Tyrone implode at the weekend would you it's not beyond the bounds of possibility is it no so that's a neutral venue too Doesn't, it's going to be very interesting to see that's, this no that's a noma that one Tyrone Armagh oh is it okay uh, no no uh, Westmead Tyrone yeah. is going to be neutral oh yeah sorry yeah of course yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Hurley from Cork we have wanted to play Kerry all year big game hunters this is um, everybody's talking Cork up this week right if only there was a way that Cork could already have qualified to play Kerry this season how could they have managed to do that mm. what would they have needed to do to get to that stage does this oh, oh they could have but they weren't good enough does this not happen every time Cork play Kerry this? yes like everyone, yes. everyone tries to make the argument for Cork yes and until Cork actually beat Kerry I mean, obviously they did in COVID, but in a non-COVID year, right? Mm. Come on, yeah. everybody just needs to wind their neck in. I believe is no, it is. It is pocky queef, so you never know. But sorry, we've one last thing that we need to talk about as well. I wish Nathan was here because Nathan was in two weeks ago, ten days ago. Uh, maybe it was just last Wednesday, talking about how um, Roy McIlroy decided he was going to shut up and not answer questions anymore. And I opened the papers today and it's uh, Rory Macro like, oh yeah, Bruce Kapke should definitely play for the American Ryder Cup team. He's like uh, number two in the list and he's only played two tournaments. How could you play without him? But what about the Europeans? Oh no, that's a totally different scenario. They should not play. And then they're asking him about his own game. He's like, oh, I've never felt as shaky over, uh, over the ball as, as I did for those four days ever. Uh, he's talking about his driver. I'm like, this, yeah. is, this is a good copy, Rory. For a man who doesn't want to say anything, he's he's given the given the headline writers plenty of ammunition. Yeah, uh, like it was never going to happen, though, was it? He was never going to shut up and not say anything. I can't remember a time where I felt so uncomfortable over the ball for four days. Yeah, all right, okay. I mean, that's pretty honest. That's, it that, is, that's, but if you're if you're Patrick Reed going toe to toe with him down the back nine at the open, do you just lean in and go, "You feeling comfortable over the ball there, Rory?" Are you? Are you back? That's what I would do. Why? Why though? Does he? So his, his quotes on Brooks. I don't know if there's anyone else in the Liver Astra that would make the team on merit and how they're playing. But Brooks is definitely a guy I think deserves to be in the US team. Why is Why is it different than for the Europeans? He just doesn't want to play with the the Liver Rebels, I suppose. But because uh, the, they're they're technically banned and mm. the Americans aren't. I don't know. It's it's a legal thing that they went to court for. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. But I like that. That's that idea that Rory McIlroy was going to shut up and for 6 months 12 months we would hear nothing from him except for the very basics on his round uh, not, not going to happen this is the least surprising headline I think right. it's been all week it's uh, 7.58 it's time for the cash machine off the balls cash machine Right, so May turned out to be our biggest month yet. We've given away over 620 grand to 15 winners, but on Wednesday, somebody missed an opportunity to win the cash. That means we've got a rollover. What better way to start the summer than with a lodgement to your bank of more than 20 grand in it? Taking part's very easy. Every day we give you a new amount, you take note of it, you enter, and then today at three o'clock, if Barry Dunn calls and you give the correct amount, you win the cash. If you've entered since five o'clock on Tuesday, you're still in to win, but you must know the amount we're about to give you. The cash machine has been reloaded, and the amount you need to know is 20,831 euros and nine cents. So 20,831.09. To enter, text OTB and only OTB 
to 57557. If we call you after three o'clock, you've got to answer within five rings. Tell us the exact amount and you win the money. So text OTB to 57557. Cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play. You've got to be over 18. You're playing across the Go Loud network. Full terms are on our website at offthewall.com. Get your entry in by 3 o'clock on Thursday, June 1st. And we could be calling you. Answer within five rings. Tell us the amount and the cash is yours. Off the Balls Cash Machine. Right, coming up after the break, we're talking League of Ireland and European football with Vinnie Perth. Now, over the next few weeks, Off the Ball is going to be travelling to France in style with Irish ferries and exploring Nantes, Bordeaux and La Rochelle. Some people drew the short straw of having to go to Nantes, Bordeaux and La Rochelle and had a very good time, it turns out. Uh, This is all to show what Irish ferries have to offer ahead of the Rugby World Cup in partnership with Irish ferries. See travel differently. Here's a little short clip from the series with Alan Quinlan himself telling Ashling about FaceTiming Ron Nogara during last year's La Rochelle celebrations when they returned home. OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball 3, 2, 1, go Whether you're a Drive To Survive fan or Grand Prix expert now you can stay up to date with the world of F1 The F1 Pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza The ultimate podcast for F1 fans The F1 Pod will keep you on the edge of your seat For the best insight and analysis, subscribe to the Off The Ball daily podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. The F1 pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza. Formula One? Yeah, we go to town on it. Alan, this is the exact place where we saw those scenes, incredible scenes after La Rochelle won the Heineken Champions Cup. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, I was FaceTiming Ron and and, uh, he was up in one of these towers here with the players and uh, the scenes were amazing. Um, I think the population is 77,000 in La Rochelle and it was yeah. 35, 40,000 people here so oh. more than half the population were here um, in what a beautiful setting and Big time it has that happened. holiday feel doesn't it? Really it really does you know? yeah. I never would have thought of, of La Rochelle to be honest to go as a holiday destination and really when Ronan took them over is when I started to hear more about La Rochelle until then I hadn't heard too much to be honest well, he but should, it's amazing he should, be, uh, he should be on some sort of a retainer from the French <laughs> tourism board because I'm sure that uh, there's so many more Irish people have come out here and, and been intrigued yeah. by you know not 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 necessarily the rugby but by the fact that um, you hear a lot about La Rochelle back home now since there's an Irish coach here obviously what an ideal kind of place to probably spend a few days OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Right, you're very welcome back. Uh, Vinnie Perth is with us. Vinny, good morning to you. Good morning. How are we doing? Uh, Philly, get outside. Um, uh, a font of information on football, uh, check out Football Daily, has made a very good point that a couple of weeks ago in studio you outlined how to beat Shamrock Rovers and they've lost twice since. It's all down to you. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Blueprint. I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, that welcome in Tala, so um, I didn't need Phil adding to it there either and, and letting people know. Um, Jesus, help me out. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think you're getting or we're getting a wish um, to be fair we've got a real league title race I'd like to think even down as far as Pats in 29 points who would be you know five off the top of the league are thinking and how people have the right mindset to say does a league up for grabs this year potentially and it might be the year where Rovers fall off and uh, we've got to push on and as a club I hope they're thinking that way that's the way winners should think and I hope that's the mindset of other teams in the league but yeah it's it's I don't know whether teams are overachieving in an underachieving league I, I just don't know where we're at uh, I look at this Rovers team and I say 18 games they've played so we're halfway through the season and they've only won nine half of them so by and large that shouldn't be good enough to win you a league and at the moment there wouldn't be obviously they're a point behind Derry but um, and and I, I, I never compare eras but you go back to 2017 and Cork City after 18 games would have been were on 44 points right Dundalk, 10, 10, so, clear. 10 clear Dundalk in 2018 were on 42 points and the bit of shit show that I managed in 2019 we were on 38 uh, but to give context just pick the 2019 season because I know I'm talking about on that one we had just started a 26 game unbeaten run 
and that's what champions do around this time June, July, August is when they win the league so the point I make is Rovers be under pressure back in them now you can't compare leagues because it's debatable but the point I make is um, and it's why I've brought up Derry a couple of times to say this team winning 50% of your game shouldn't win your league title so this team have to kick on now or else um, be, or, or Derry have to kick on and really put them under serious pressure but there's questions to be answered you have to say that um, losing uh, or, or dropping points in 50% of your games is not good enough at the moment and you have to, you have to sort of ask questions why do you think there's been a consistent theme in the games they've lost because early on at the start of the season it felt a little bit like they were just there was red cards and there were uh, players not fully in form and they just hadn't settled and then they settled and looked like they turned a corner and now they're having another blip which is unusual uh, I, I, th- I think it's to be fair I think it's been a mixture of a lot of things I think I, I would question whether this team is clinical enough Okay, in terms of for the amount of possession they have, and they're brilliant, and people, people will wax lyrical about them, and it's and and again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, and people have heard me say, it, it is that sort of we call it a Man City way. It's possession, 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 and uh, how many clear cut chances are they having um, in games? And there was one stat from from the draw of the game which they lost where they. 20 something 20 odd shots but generally um, and we, we'll do it in the next couple of weeks if this continues but they're generally just shots on target is down in single figures and four and five mm-hmm. um, and it, that's not that's not going to win you enough games of football and it can be easy to defend against that if if it's all in front of you in front of you uh, it's and, and teams will say oh, they're getting bashed uh, and, and it's about so if you're an opposition manager and you're playing Shamrock Rovers what you've got to do is you've got to get into your player's head that you might have the crowd up you might have them have possession they might bounce the ball around they'll switch play little little ones and twos but while it's in front of you and it's not going in behind you you've just got to stay calm and that's the problem not all players do that and they someone will jump out and go and press a guy leave a little bit of space in behind and um, so there's a mixture of all of them things and discipline has been an issue whether you know whether referees have made the right calls or wrong calls they've had a fair few sending offs and they lost three players on the pitch in Cork the other day and you can't win games after losing three players for sending offs I saw someone saying on Twitter last night Shamrock Rovers are averaging a red card every three games the last five seasons of the English Football League and Scottish Premiership only Hamilton in 19 and 20 came even close to that so like that contextualises just how per yeah. discipline stuff is well look the the refereeing in a league is a different issue to this one I think right because what, what you've got to look at um, and, and Stephen Bradley made reference to the draw of the game same referee sent off five of the players three in the court game and two against draw the two sending offs in draw they were justified right so Lee Grace jumps in on a yellow card makes a bad tackle no one in isolation would say that wasn't a yellow yeah. card but when you when you group the five of them together you say this ref has given us five so the three the other day they appealed to Richie Tell one so the linesman gives that decision and uh, Rovers put a camera in their goal so that ends up on the internet and we see the incident but I can clearly see and by the way so Richie Towell used to be called my love child around the change room so I would not say a bad word about the man he was, he's been huge for my career as well and um, and I'd like to think I helped him in a small way so I wouldn't but he's given the referee decision to make the two, two players fall to the ground Richie sort of kicks out player holds his head and people have seen this online the linesman's looking across and a decision to make the referee didn't give the decision so it was a red card uh, decision made the mistake ref gave the ball was in play so if that is a foul it should have been a penalty to mm. Cork no one has really brought that up and then the other two incidents are second yellows okay and I can understand Rovers frustration on them but what is key to it is when Johnny Kenny who's a young player has come back from Celtic and I, I think he's ex- exceptional forward but there's a little bit of petulance in Johnny in, in terms of when he's been taken off and different things he's on the yellow makes a silly tackle and the key to it is the key to to what happens is um, if you watch the incident Jack Bourne has a right go off him because you gave the referee decision to make mm. now the Sean Horwin same thing Sean makes a, a tackle player goes down holding his ankle 
to be fair to Rovers most referees will go I've, I've sent two off have a word with Sean and say one more and maybe it is and that's why I don't like questioning referees on second yeah. because you don't see the whole sort of I, I was in Richmond so I wasn't at the court game and when I watch it back but Jack Bourne absolutely hammered Sean Hoare from giving the referee decision to make so discipline has to improve from the teams in our league but there's no doubt then referee and standards have to improve so it's 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 quite a, a mixture of, of all of them things and what Rovers have done is they should be close to 40 points and have a comfortable you, you were speaking earlier on about giving young players a chance mm. well I tell you what if you're Rovers now you're not giving young players a chance in a hurry until you get your lead back yeah. and that's the key to it you no and that's where the, the average age of the very top teams like Celtic like Rovers like is generally the highest yeah. in the league because you're under pressure to win games every week the, the the one positive I guess for Rovers is the home game tomorrow night against Dundalk probably couldn't come against better opposition Dundalk haven't won in their last three there's a bit of a I don't know I guess the fans aren't overly happy with yeah. management and owners yeah this, this is a story I think Dundalk bubbling underneath so I was at Richmond Park the other day and Pats against um, Dundalk and what I seen in that game was I seen Richmond Park and I have to say to touch on, on Richmond Park real quickly like there's a guy there Keane Menton and it's a small point but the mascots he looks after them and it's just a, a volunteer in the club but he brings them on the lap of honour before the pl- yeah, as the players goes in and you get a standing ovation and I was just thinking to myself imagine being 8 or 9 yeah. and you know that that clapping fans thing is something you take for granted as a footballer but actually it's something that's kind of special like and people talk about professional footballers did he really you know you know the way they see them with the hand yeah. in the bottle maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. but these kids love it and you're going that's that's when clubs have cracked it because these are becoming you can see these kids like they're loving it but um, so but the atmosphere and everything about Pats was really good the stadium over four and a half thousand it was probably the worst travelling support I've seen from Dundalk at a Pats game in over ten years right the fans have are drifting away and we and I always make this reference while, while everything is growing and growing got to be careful we treat our fans with respect and, and, and make sure they keep turning up so um, Dundalk has Stephen O'Donnell made mistakes as a manager yes uh, absolutely and he, he's the type of guy who would admit that all managers make mistakes football is about fine margins he lost the game the other day 2-1 uh, Pats had a man sent off in a bizarre incident again going back to referees but bizarre incident and Dundalk are down to or Pats are down to 10 men Dundalk are well in the game and get beaten again and, and just look like they did a soft belly and maybe tactically Stevie would think about one or two decisions and they went to a back three and chased it and conceded but Dundalk are in a lot of trouble at the moment off the pitch peak six the owners of Dundalk were ran out of Irish football uh, put a huge amount of money into it and did they make mistakes absolutely uh, I was part of it uh, one of the reasons I went back is I felt and they they, they and I've always kept on dark stuff private I don't believe in writing books or or sp- you know because the in, what goes on you know you're managing a business in, in a football club and it's not for for repeating stuff but one of the reasons I went back at the time is I felt they'd learned a lesson I felt they'd, they were willing to improve things and they got ran out of town so but what's happened is the hurlers on the ditch sometimes get off the ditch and start hurling and people have found out actually running League of Ireland clubs is really difficult and there hasn't been a single improvement in that club since Peak Six have left and it's reflecting on the pitch and it's 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 pretty it's pretty sad to see um, and our, while Stevie O'Donnell has taken some responsibility for stuff on the pitch I actually think he's overachieving with that with that group of players he have and I'm concerned for Dundalk. Uh, things aren't going well for them, and um, it's and yet they've only lost six games. Yeah, I like, think he's overachieving. Yeah. yeah, and and again, sport is full of fine margins. So they play Shamrock Rovers on Friday up in Tala, and I think if they win that game, you know they go up to fourth potentially. European spot isn't that far away, but remember. It's only a ten-team league, mm. you know. Forty f- percent uh, of the league win a European spot, so yeah. it's not. I'm not saying it's not difficult but it is achievable a lot of stuff is achievable within the league they don't feel like one of the teams who could go on a run at the moment and catapult themselves into European places or do they? 
don't know because we, we spoke about Sligo a couple of months ago and then they went and, and just continued to lose and then they go and beat Derry the other day <laughs> and the, the challenge I have is you see you see teams now in the league it wouldn't shock me if any team outside the top two lost four in a row wouldn't shock me but it also wouldn't shock me if any of them went and won four, four in a row so it's it, 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 it does, it's such a, a mixed match and we don't know that's that's the sort of debate that's starting is is the standard too high you look at Sligo I think up until last week and I haven't seen the stats after last week so you imagine it's still the same they made they were the second most completed passes in the league but they were toured from bottom so you know is there a is, is football changing a little bit where it's pass, pass, pass? Well, I don't know. Uh, Go it, back to Roscommon in Dublin. Is, yeah. I was say. <laughs> is, is this, um, is that a, a team who is discovering itself and and like building something and then over the third ha- third quarter of the season and the final quarter of the season, they begin to, uh, or are they trapped and they're lacking a cutting edge and they're, they're incapable of converting the possession? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, and, I don't know how to answer that because you're probably right in terms of they are a team that were brought together a lot of guys from outside of Ireland I think they brought in 10 players and 8 of them were from outside of Ireland so and what I mean by that is sort of uh, wherever different different parts of the world so um, not like uh, and this uh, I'm trying not to make a lazy comment here but English Br- British football can be quite easy if they were coming from English football, as in League One, League Two, yeah. champ- or um, even lower than that conference, because it's quite similar. But they have a lot of guys coming from further afield. Um, so I'd like to think John Russell has a plan, and it looks like to come together. They've been exceptional at different stages. But the other fear is, and come away from Sligo second is, are teams forgetting how to um, go and? Uh, I had a friend watching Shells and Bowls on TV and his, his comment was and he'd be a real football person for want of a better word but when he rang me on the way home I was coming from uh, Richmond we were just checking in on how the games were and he was like does no one put the ball in behind anymore does no one like and and it's like pass for pass sake and I sound like a dinosaur or uh, I'm only out of the league a year or two but you're like Football is has to be careful it doesn't become sterile. Interestingly, while you or 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 a sport is discussing the the whole sort of dubs or common thing, yeah. you have to be careful that you you're easy on the eye and not creating enough, more chances. Going back to Rovers, you know, do they do they get enough for the fullbacks in behind or the wing backs? And for, it, it's a it's a debate that's starting to happen now because as I said possession for possession's sake or looking pretty is one thing yeah but actually having go and win games but you'd hope that somebody it's so I presume Stephen O'Donnell was thinking that when he went to the three at the back it's like I'm going to go and try and win this game and then it doesn't work and you get punished for it and so you automatically then become more conservative afterwards and yeah not to second guess O'Donnell but the, the key to the key to when a team goes against 10 men is generally hurt them in wide areas right okay so have two wingers and two fullbacks and go that way okay but that, that's my view Okay, when you go the other way it's all and central sorry, one last thing on, on the point there if, if the league is becoming this uh, passing and uh, kind of boring sterile uh, then surely there's room for some team to emerge and, and be counter cyclical like you, you do the opposite of what the whole league is doing so you're going to be effective yeah. against almost and I, everybody and I think, I think it's, it's not becoming boring in one sense as in you're getting lots of good results and, t- yeah. and inconsistencies okay but actually when you when you and, Watch and the full 90 minutes when, when you completely tactically analyse it or so th- there's a, a group going through their pro licence at the moment so they will be doing a little bit of this and I, I'm sure they will be you know looking at certain things but I think Bowles do that at certain points I think sometimes they've gone away from that and do the night they sort of Bowles do that a little bit of where you've got your Dylan Connolly's up front your Afal Abbey's up front and uh, Twardick or whoever it is and a little bit of pace up front and um in any football, whether it's the highest, highest level international football, what what is key is is pace. That's what horse teams. And if you're not quick in modern day football, then you better be bloody good. You mm. better be Xavi or Iniesta yeah. nowadays. Or, yeah. You know. So it, it it is becoming a running game. We haven't spoken about Derry. Yeah. It's just a flakiness with Derry at the moment that would frustrate you if you were a Derry fan, or even like 
I'd love to see Rovers have to chase somebody down because I think that'd be really good for everybody. I think that would inspire them to be more aggressive and we haven't really seen that. We haven't seen them need to be aggressive to win a league. Yeah. For me, for me, that's the key to the whole league. Can Derry, can Derry put Rovers under pressure? And and I, and I say that in the sense of of his many friends or ex players in the, the Rovers dressing room as I do in the Derry dressing room. So I'd be very close to McElhenney and Duffy and Dummigan, uh, as I would be. Dan Cleary was another one that was called one of my love childs as a coach. <laughs> as you get like you were a busy players. man. Yeah, I tell you what, uh, Tell or Gannon, Sean Hoare. So I, I don't have a particular one that I want to win the league but I want what I do want to see is I want to see a competitive league as in someone pushing yeah. somebody and we haven't seen that and it, the challenge is up for Derry um, they were they've been good at different stages particularly away from home but against Sligo and I think Rory has spoken himself they were just just weren't good enough and Sligo the man crazy John Mann sent a half sent off crazily but they just didn't penetrate enough and again it goes back to me, me, my last point just have to be careful you're not easy on the eye like they've got some outstanding wingers in in Graydon and uh, Michael Duffy Michael Duffy's probably he's up there as one of the best players in the league I always say wingers because they because they have to tuck themselves out in the left don't get the same plaudits at times but they've got some outstanding footballers getting Patrick McElhenney back into that midfield is huge and there's no doubt injuries have affected them but I suppose you used the right word there's a flakiness about them in terms of results it's Captain Obvious over here but obviously to, to win a league you need to create chances and score goals Ollie O'Neill doesn't strike most people as a natural striker I think they had one shot on target in that game against Sligo as well Yeah, I know Colin Whelan has been sidelined so that's an issue in, in and of itself but creating chances is the issue isn't it uh, scoring goals scoring goals it's, it's, it's a bit of it's a bit of Duffy will score you enough goals if he remains fit Duffy will get into the sort of 10, 12s but there's no doubt they, they have searched for that striker Patching's form has dropped off a little bit so he creates a huge amount of chances Patrick McElhenney's being injured so it looks like Jamie McGonagall is in and out of the team at the moment whether that's injury we don't know but it looks like I mean there is a shortage in number nines in, yeah. in football like in, um, across the world and it's definitely the case in our league the best striker is probably Pat Hoban and, and at Dundalk and then followed by Gaffney who's had a better season than Pat last year and then beyond that you're looking at young Johnny Kenny but you're probably struggling for out and out Max Matter has had a great season for Sligo but we've a huge shortage of goal scorers mm. and again I'd find it hard to play up front for some of these teams because it's it's pass 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 and um, you'd like a little bit more service and um, like there's no there are no Glenn Crows or Trevor Vaughan's in the league at the moment are there like proper goal scorers uh, Jason Burns well I, I'd say to you Hulban but like who, outside of Hulban he's gone like in the game the other day Pat's gone in different areas looking for the ball and trying to link up and he's not being the centre forward because his team aren't good enough at the moment so outside of Pat Huben, I would probably agree with you Gaffney does some things but he does them slightly different we've a, we've a shortage in number nines and people want to know why I think I've said it before but we used to play 4-4-2 so your law of averages means we're now playing with one striker and from all the way from under eights all the way up so your law of averages tells you is from eight years of age you're only working with one number nine now as opposed to two so statistically you're not going to develop as many yeah difficult to fix that with like you want to get more people more time on the ball more touches at underage level but also you want to show them the killer instinct so I mean I don't know maybe you can convince some of those wide players to play through the middle as they get or, from or maybe going back to going back to your your debate around the G8 maybe you just let kids play well what do you think of this because uh, a four four two. So so be it. Do something different as a coach. Don't follow Pep Guardiola. Um, the underage soccer is way more competitive at, at eights, nines, tens, elevens yeah. than GA. Is that a good or a bad thing? Do you think? Um, see, I think it's a good thing. Right. <laughs> but does 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 a does a lad on my shoulder shouting at me going? <laughs> 
what about the participation what about getting just getting the kids out so it's finding that balance and it is I think it's, it's so difficult because because so you're thinking from the elite professional yes. side of things right yes. and that's um, but there needs to be somebody else thinking about actually we have a sport that has mass participation already but for whatever reason we're not producing enough players I would say to you to be fair to the FEI okay don't know the whole ins and outs of it because it's not rolled out yet but they're looking at a, a sort of calendar year around football so for example summer street leagues are similar yeah well uh, uh, yes so and and give you one example and it's not going to do the FA's report but you take if we were able to switch certain sections of Irish football to even closer to summer football so take December, January are really awful months in this country yeah. it used to be November it's sort of December, January if that became your futsal local sort of time yeah futsal is a brilliant tool to develop players skills touch so obviously for those who don't know futsal is basically a, a small ball it's like size three it's smaller mm. than your four indoor halls all little touch 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 uh, bouncing ball around and it's almost like Spanish football yeah. to use it sorry, right so how do you get players good at that give them two months of it in the middle of the round in winter and in so many of these halls that have popped up and school halls and uh, community centres and run little leagues around it or or whatever the case may be so I think that would be one small fix but it's such a a big thing for them to get in so I think the FEI would like when I say calendar year football so it's not about flogging the same coaches so if you're coaching a Cherry Orchard under 13s like uh, I have a friend coaching I think it's under 14s and he's saying to me because he's listening to our debate and he's saying but I need a break now he's not saying that he doesn't want to work in the summer he's like now I need a little bit of a break for a month or two yeah. it's about when that month or two well that's around. what I was saying if the break happened around yeah, Christmas in yeah. January and it was dark and annoying to go out at night everybody would be like oh this is great I can sit yeah. and watch telly whereas in the summertime it's actually easy to get everybody to go out and so people are going to be on holidays but the results ultimately shouldn't matter like yeah. that that one trophy that that under 14 team won is not the crowning moment of their life otherwise we end up like Friday Night Lights where no so I, I give you an example of how football and now I'm going back a long time but I played for probably the greatest Cherry Orchard team of all time as in trophy wise we won everything we won the Milk Cup as well so that, that that's uh, under 14 under 16, under 16. so okay. back then there was only one we, we beat Rangers in a final mm. okay uh, in a sold out cold rain maze and all that stuff and we, we 10 Irish internationals in the first under 15 squad and all that stuff and just but outside of Barry Prandeville myself and Eamon McLaughlin and I was genuinely and I'm not saying this for uh, an X Factor crying I was one of the worst of our, our squad I never made international under 15 16 with guys gone all over England for but only three of us became in any way shape or form so all the trophies we won all the league titles we won the domination like we won the league one year I think it was under 15 by dropping a point a point right. and we only won it by two because Belvedere dropped three points right. they lost the ones to us and dro- drew so with us in theory the standard is really high but actually it's not really high it's just that there's super focus on competition and winning as opposed to developing the players uh, yeah it, it, it's a mixture of all and it was a different time right so development was different yeah. in terms of uh, the league run pathway or whatever exactly. but the point I'm making is it's not about winning the trophies but you have to you also have to teach that as well like it's a bit like there's a, there's a job in football called the front post hole okay most people know what that is but if you don't keep, teach kids that and if you don't teach a fella how to do that role and he goes on trial say for example to England and the man says I want you to do the front post hole and he's standing there front post hole so mm. you have to educate young kids that's about skill acquisition yeah no, but I don't think that's about winning and losing so you can teach everybody the front post hole at under 6 under 7 okay, under 9 but, I think but that that's just one small example of you've got to teach a kid how to be clinical you've got to teach him how when we're 2 up we go 4 up yeah. and then the game's over yeah. so when do you do that do you well, take off your best players and give other 
players a chance but, and that's the debate I'm not I'm not saying that's what I would do in the goal games they 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 play matches yeah. so, so they play matches and the kids are keeping score and they're also up against their yeah. their nearest rival who they're marking mm. and they're very intently marketing marking them it's just that there's no league and so more players will reach under 12 ideally with yeah. more skills acquired and then then I I still think it's still a bit early to be well, like, I, tr- I throw this one at you then and the joy of the game is dead now you must go and kill your opponent we, we, we need a debate with probably the head of um performance in, in Irish rugby is Dara Sharon I, I may not have had given his right title but he worked in New Zealand for a long time and obviously in, in sport but there there is you, how many kids do you think would turn up so you turn up and you get a band so if there's enough for four teams you get four different colour bands Okay. and you play you just turn up no teams no no structure and it'd be, un, it'd be say under 10s 11s so I might have red, blue, green, orange. And you just, you go, you're assigned to a pitch and you go play, the reds play blues and you play four matches. And just, I would I would think parents would turn up and sign up to that with the kids because it's about playing. Oh, it's totally. about getting involved. And even some really Sorry, good kids would turn up. Are you saying that's up. what rugby do at the moment? No, so that was a, a pilot run in, in New Zealand. Okay. okay? And uh, Dara has done a, a thesis on that around uh, his education. It would be interesting to get his views on it. But when I heard that, and um, um, unfortunately, Dara's brain works completely different level than mine, right? So I, I, I have to sit with him and discuss it. But actually, just the bare bones of that idea is brilliant for a local community where the other thing about like I, I live in City West now right so it's and not to go on a, a rant here but there's been a big community built in City West apartment blocks everywhere I moved up 15 years ago fields everywhere if I wanted to set up a team called City West FC or City West GEA I cannot do it you know why no, no fields it's gone now we have to fix housing mm. crisis there's no fields so there's no communities being built and to go back to this band thing is so imagine my son is playing on the pitch and let's let's say I'm just a normal Joe from Tallet right go back to what I am alright my son's playing on the pitch with a yellow band and the local doctor's son is playing on the pitch with the yellow band all of a sudden I've built a relationship with the local doctor and that's how the GAA works that's how but We've got to get back to that, and it's such a good opportunity. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and and go to go games with all sports. And people love football. Like yeah. it's just I I did there. I was talking about this a couple of times this week. I did see a kid being shouted at, and maybe it was just because the dubs swear more. But telling the, the kid to there you go. And kick well, it in, they're allowed to. Well, Shane, though, yeah. Shane, give me what you use. Use. I'm go, I don't know what their culture is. Is that a, a not a nice he, term he anymore? Thinks, he thinks he's not. I'm a, a townie from the country. Yeah, yeah but yeah. still a culture. You still too. have your own lingo. Ta- oh, we do. Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me to feck off in culture language. There is a word you I would just have. say feck off. I. Eh? Nah, you don't. Say. <laughs> yeah. You see, you're, you're using the feck. There's a subtle difference. Yeah, this yeah, kid yeah, was not yeah. told to feck. Well, I'm being politically correct. Yeah, All right. Okay. Probably can't say what I would say up with my mates. Yeah. Come here. We're almost completely out of time but uh, you correctly said uh, in the ad break that Anne should take the se- the, the Spurs yes, job absolutely and by the way um, I, I won't go into it but maybe some other time we discuss it the way he plays football if Kane stays would absolutely su- sue Spurs if he if, if he stays if though. he stays of course he plays with a front three tactically he's brilliant mm. okay but I'm sorry I'm going to upset a lot of people and, but He's, he could get bored with Scottish football quite quickly fair enough and I think tactically the way he plays he plays with a front three um, his number 8 joins in number 10 and his wingers make inverted runs all the time with the ball and one of his midfielders come out and he, he's brilliant at the way he does it I actually think tactically he suits Spurs and the likes of John Duggan would be happy because it's entertaining it's a, so you think with Charleston uh, Son and Harry Kane he actually would play the three of them mm. as three forwards or two wide areas and come up with all different solutions he is uh, an outstanding coach and I actually hope he gets the sports job because I think he he I, I like clubs to, to kick on I think he'd be a top four he deserves the money at Spurs he deserves a top job and there's no doubt Spurs is a top job I'm just concerned for him that the mess that is Levy and everything off the pitch 
He doesn't like a man over his shoulder. I, I don't. I don't know. Is that overplayed? I don't know. Is it overplayed? How much? Yes, Daniel Levy hasn't done his business right for a year or two, but I tell you what, they're one hell of a successful business that I'm sure they will have money to spend. Um, no from, debt, no significant debt that prevents no. them from uh, obviously this revenue stream debt, is there yeah. with that ground. I, I see it happening. So we'll we'll have to go. The dub will take his stance on it, and you mm. being a. Logger, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll that's it. That's that the word you're logger. looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, have, we, we, we got there eventually. <laughs> Jackie's over here. Look at this. Any good stuff. Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. I'm, not, I'm not a Jackie. I'm, no, no. Uh, of course. Although, I thought I was in the last 10. So county tail, Dublin, so, man. Now. You know. Kildare's County Dublin now. Hey, <laughs> careful. We'll, we'll see on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is 8.33, OTB AM, live with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition is available now. Jenny Claffey is up next talking French Open. First, here's Joe and Dan chatting on last night's show about Nathan Collins. Now, if we were talking in January, Nathan Collins may well have been number one. Um, but Julian Lopetegui came in. Yeah. He said, Craig Dawson, you're my guy. And so, in effect, up until maybe the last um, week or two of the season, Collins has pretty much met an abrupt end to... Yeah, he played the last two games. Team. He did play the last two games, which is... which is And there is an encouraging end to that. Okay. Yeah. Well, do you, so, I suspect he'll stay for sure for another season. Oh, well, 100%. Uh, yeah. Like, the one thing that you're guaranteed in the Premier League is... You'll be sacked soon, manager. I just have to stick this out for a year or two, and then maybe my face fits again. If oh, I wouldn't be worried about Collins at all. I actually wouldn't have. I'd have Under not. Uh, no, I wouldn't be worried. Break back in. I think. I think Lopetegui came in with a firefighting mission okay. to stay up. Um, I think there would be a view that Collins, like he's a record signing, he's the long-term guy. Yeah. Um, some speculation even around Kilman, who's the left-sided defender, might he go? I don't even know if that's going to happen or not. Um, but he's an investment by the club. I just think Collins. Like he played a lot of football. He just had these uh, concentration issues in games, or like there's a mistake lurking. But on paper, like he's one of these where, like he's like he's been a, not a high player, but the football people from the age of like 17, 18, like this guy's a player. They can all see it. I think people who train with him all see it. It's just about ironing that out. Yeah. But I suspect a full preseason at Wolves. I I'm actually not concerned about him at all. Right. I hope that uh, Dan is correct there. It, uh, there's good chances a new manager at Wolves, so we'll see if the new manager fancies uh, Nathan Collins a bit more than Lopetegui does or if maybe he can find Lopetegui's good graces but anyway let's move on French Open time Jenny Claffey is with us Jenny how are you? Very well good to be back here guys um, You're not going to the French Open you, we're delighted to have you here but we're disappointed for you that you're not yeah, it's uh, in shame. Paris It's a shame we're not doing this live from, from the French Open uh-huh. today but maybe next year um, Have you? Have you? Do you go to many of the tournaments? Like is that is it, is it okay, are you okay going to tournaments now? <laughs> yeah, interesting you put it that way because when I was playing, like at the time when I was playing, um, I used to, to go to them more often and then I had this love-hate relationship with tennis once I retired and didn't want to have anything to do with Wimbledon or any of the tournaments whatsoever. So this was going to be my... First time yeah, back? Yeah, my maiden trip back. All oh, right, okay. Unfortunately, injury got in the way. It's mad because isn't there a clip of Gary Neville? Someone said Gary Neville once was at a, at a charity match or something and he was like, he, he just hated the idea of kicking the football. Just even when he retired, Stephen Hendry was the same in snooker for a while want to pick up a queue like is it, this, is it the same in, in those intervening years immediately after you retire that you're like ah don't put me near a racket well, definitely for me it was um, because it was it was a forced retirement you know with, with an injury that I sustained that I it came out of nowhere that I didn't didn't see that coming and mm. you know I was having such good success and and then yeah I wanted to have nothing to do with tennis for a good I'd say th- two to three years after didn't want to have anything to do with it didn't want to go into coaching right. um, subsequently now I'm, I have a tennis coaching business but at that time I looked into moving careers I didn't want to have anything to do with tennis and then kind of my love has come back for the game in the last years what was the injury? an elbow I ha- end up with um, no cartilage in the joint surface in my elbow so like, even now I can't straighten my arm fully because it's bone on bone so right. it's quite painful still and I can't play tennis now you can't fix that that's not like a, you know grow it in a lab and inject it in it's just one of those things you don't have it anymore they're not making any more of it no so they tried they, I've had two surgeries on it and the second one they, they drilled into the they call it a microfracture thing into the back of the elbow to try and release yeah. some cartilage but it didn't so those are tiny little holes that they yeah. drill and then it's supposed to seep out and yeah. heal yeah. it didn't happen unfortunately but I'm waiting for some great new medicine to right. yeah, break and through. so you can't actually just play for fun no so after I retired I, I learned to play tennis left handed oh right and coached left handed for a good holy few years holy shit yeah. wow that's impressive um, well I had to because I couldn't oh, play look at me. I'm not that good at sports 
board and just really good at everything. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, Sickening. Just, yeah. yeah. So uh, the odd time now I, I put it back in my right hand, but yeah, I can play left hand. It's pretty cool. And is your injury a football injury? The one I have now. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's very annoying. Just go to one another sport, and then I think I'm just made of glass to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Body breaks down at every chance. Does the does the left arm feel like the right arm felt? If that makes sense. Not at all. No. No. But it was it was a mad transition because it was like completely t- like you know trying to learn oh, the so game yeah. with the other hand. My train your brain and everything and the movement so different. And um, but then I, st- I started playing a lot and then was considering competing with it. Just I mean not like in for leagues and yeah, yeah. local mm. just for fun to get back into it. Uh, but then I decided why would I go from being the best with my right hand to then not being the best in my life. Oh, that's you know? that's very interesting little debate in your head and um, so is that not just would you not just love the competition I found it playing football or paddle tennis okay. or other sports okay. not not in tennis yeah ego you see comes into it as well that was it my pride <laughs> totally but would that not be amazing too if you could win in your left hand like, look I could even win left handed yeah. it's a bit, a bit Ronnie O'Sullivan a bit Ronnie O'Sullivan yeah, yeah. but could you imagine if I lost to someone and they say they beat Jenny Claffey they're not going to be saying they beat her with her left hand so <laughs> <laughs> I could never live that down wow okay this is what separates the sports people from most I just would like just okay fair enough <laughs> let's talk about the French Open um, so uh, Danny Medvedev straight out um, that was a shock right yeah I think it was a bit of a shock although at the same time you know up until he won Rome Masters there a week ago he was going on about and everyone knew about how much he hated the clay court surface uh, but he had great form as we said in Rome he won the title and then he was talking about how he felt more confident on the surface and then an absolute flop in the mm. first round he was the number two seed I think people had kind of um, backed him to do better this year um, but unfortunately he was beaten by a, a, a qualifier guy who's like ranked outside the top 150 or something how important is form coming into a major like is it generally speaking someone who has been shooting the lights out coming into a major that wins it or can can you have that almost someone who just springs from the blue and, and has a run well there seems to be it's hard to predict that I yeah. guess because we've seen it over the years like I maybe not so much in, in the French Open with like with Nadal being so dominant but you've seen on the women's side like players coming with no having won no tournaments on the lead up and then coming in and, and winning it um, like you know Svantec a few years ago her first title we had heard about her but she wasn't dominating as much as she was say last year in her in the clay court season and, she, and she'd won it so I mean yes you think form is going to Mm. be an indicator anyway and can be an indicator but then if we look at Djokovic coming into the French Open this year he's had no form it's the first time he hasn't won a tournament coming into Roland Garros um, in the run up on the clay court season in, in over five years or something but we still can't count him out he's staying under the radar as well Djokovic is uh, yeah. per usual yeah yeah I don't, I'm um, not looking forward to, no. to seeing what happens I saw a bit of Djokovic yesterday um, particularly early on so in the first set he really struggled then really clear in the second set but in the first set he was screaming at the box like screaming at them and swearing and not in because I could understand it in whatever language he speaks um, it seemed like he was swearing in French or Spanish or something um, is that is that does he always ball out even Isovic and whoever else is beside him we've definitely seen it more often lately that he's he's maybe feeling more of the pressure of you know now trying to match or win sorry the 23 Grand Slams but we've seen it lately with him we saw it in Australia as well he was really screaming like Orny even Isovic in, in that Grand Slam and then apparently he's got a new I'm not sure who what role this guy new coach or somebody in his box and he was directing a lot of his right, anger towards him three of them sitting beside each other and this is the first time in France that the box can coach they're like yeah yeah to talk yeah um I've been reading a bit about that this week and I think last year they allowed it in America and there was some other trials and this is the first time that in this year it's going to be in uh, fr- France and Wimbledon are, are finally caught up um what difference does it make the coaching I mean it's really good to have the the positive reinforcements you know but before you go out on, on a match court you kind of have your your tactical plan and, and your game plan and what you're going to do against a certain player but then it's good to have that on the sideline I mean I'm not sure how, how much you can put down to winning or losing a match mm-hmm. based on the coaching but it does ha- help really help to have that um, positivity in your corner maybe if not so positively <laughs> shouting at them but it is somebody to, to vent at and also players need that too you know in the in the heat of battle but you're saying there in, in the first set it was like an hour and a half the first set it was 7-6 yeah. it was so close and then he absolutely demolished him in the set, next two sets Fushevich my kids were loving the pronunciation the incorrect pronunciation uh, right. <laughs> um, we had to we had to YouTube it 
just to make sure that we were staying it properly <laughs> so that would shut them up but um, <laughs> I mean, in case they were in school to say you know I was like what, what were you watching last night <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but he had like um, seven or eight break points in the first set and only won one whereas um Djokovic had won the break point that he had so he's still a cold hard killer like you give him an opportunity he's going to take it totally we know that about Djokovic he is just that steely determined incredible athlete with this amazing drive to, to win and mm-hmm. just doesn't let players in like you know after a set like that yesterday first set 7-6 you think the match would remain competitive yeah. but it almost seems like Fusevic just gave it his everything and then just Djokovic has those extra gears that the other players don't have and was able to, to you know rely on that and then just run away with the match because we've actually seen that so often in his career where he will drop a set occasionally in Grand Slams and you think oh this is going to be a close match but it never really is it's almost like he's working himself up to a level which is consistently 85-90% and other players can get to that for a short period however long it is it can be a set it can be a set and a half sometimes it's two sets and then they're they're just spent by the effort of getting up to that is that physical? Or is it is it like is it the quality of the ball placement that wears you down? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Like for Djokovic, he just has so much in his repertoire. Do you know that these guys can match it as you say for for two sets, but especially as well in a Grand Slam when it's best of five sets, that's where Djokovic seems to come alive against mm. other guys. You know, in best of three sets, it's a different yeah. different game altogether. Where Djokovic just seems to have another level beyond these other guys, and also like he's been playing the game for so many years, he's been in these situations far longer than some of these guys he's playing against. He's played so many five set matches as well in his time, so the experience he can draw on that as well but yeah if they're able to match him for two sets then it becomes I guess you know that maybe Djokovic has figured out the way to, to play the match and then he also has that physicality on these guys that he can outlast any opposition he did look a bit like an octopus at various stages there was like I don't know if it's just the way the cameras are now placed for the ultra <laughs> HD but there was there's bits where you kind of see his contortion as he's like facing one direction leans over and then the ball is gone I was like I haven't actually seen or noticed how physically pliable he is compared to normal human beings yeah he has spent a lot of time Plastic, yeah. yeah he is he spent a lot of time I think and that was a big focus maybe about you know eight to ten years ago on like the yoga and f- the, f- the flexibility that side of the game because that's that's obviously where you're going to break down as well as an athlete if you're not working on those the the mobility flexibility mm. that kind of stuff and he spent a huge amount of time focusing on you can see it like he literally as you said you know his body is back everything's facing that way but his legs are facing forward it, yeah he's kind of and the ball is pinging straight into the corner and like he can retrieve it always retrieve every ball it's yeah. just it's funny how his attitude that that negative like shouting at Ivanisevic is the complete opposite of Carlos Alcaraz he's getting a lot of praise for like really sunny happy disposition <clears throat> nearly all of the time looks like he's playing a practice match even that that game I think Sitipas said the same he, he, he constantly has a smile on his face Alcaraz probably inspiring other players to, to play that way because obviously he's world number one so it works Yeah. but that game against Tara Daniel yesterday, I think he won it in four sets Alcaraz but I mean he's just he's getting the job done but with a smile on his face which is brilliant yeah I think it's lovely to see in, in, in the game as well because mm. like in the past we've had obviously like Djokovic and Federer and Adel when Federer basket. came through he was a brat well, as a yeah, kid, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. Always screaming at people. I think Alcaraz is just in really enjoying his tennis, mm. and I think that's something we can see. Like as you said, like the, with the smile on his face, like he plays these amazing shots, and then you see him smiling. Like you know, as the opposition, that's very annoying. That's as intimidating well. as well. Yeah. Like yeah, but he has this level of confidence as well, and that's showing in his games uh, too. But the enjoyment factor is actually making him more appealing. Mm. As you say, like it's nice to watch that as well. Somebody who's, who doesn't look to be struggling as much as you might see with other players, but again, he is only just he's so young he's so new to the game as well give him a few more years and it's not fresh yeah, yeah he's fresh yeah to get ground down yeah he's cynical yeah. not that you want to knock that knock that off, that smile off his face but you know let that let's see if that will will continue what impact does the wind have because even on, on the philip chatry accord <laughs> yesterday that, that that was one thing that was mentioned after that match yeah. like, <laughs> is the wind an actual big factor during those games yeah it will be yeah like, um, cause, because for example like if you if he plays with so much power Alcaraz mm. uh, the wind is not is going to take a, away a bit of that power like if you say for example hitting into the wind so you're not knocking the opponent off the court as easily as you would the mm. points are going on a bit longer I mean for Alcaraz he did say yeah, he said it, the windy was the windy was uh, affecting yeah, him yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's why he lost that set but you know he did never really looked in too much danger I thought but the wind will impact yeah of course the conditions are going to impact the players because it takes a 
bit of the bite out of the ball and um, when it's windy if you're, and if you've got the wind behind you though then that's a different you know you've mm. got more at an advantage then it's funny the like was it Sloane Stevens I saw talking about you're talking about some of the initiatives that the French Open have come up with this year and Sloane Stevens was talking about the the mental health issues and the abuse of players and she said they're uh, it's getting worse and this year the French Open organisers have offered players AI so artificial intelligence protection I don't know how this works you sign in basically you, you use this app to sign into your account and then it blocks to each of the social media accounts that and you it, have it blocks anything that they think any combination of words that might be abusive it's interesting isn't it like I would have thought so players at a Grand Slam wouldn't be logging into their social media accounts anyway but clearly this generation would be yeah. So, so it's something to think about. It. I'm sure during a tournament, you have that much downtime and that much time to be on your phone and 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 things to distract yourself. I guess that that would be a something important. Yeah, there are there are so many distractions. Obviously, playing those big tournaments like the Grand Slams, like this is a lot of media attention. But there is a huge amount of downtime, as you said mm-hmm. there, when you play. Like you know, you have your in the day. You have you might go through your routines of like you know, obviously outside of meal times, it's a warm up and then your match time. But then there's a whole other host of hours in the day to fill. But I think I do think that's really important that the the Grand Slams are addressing that issue with mental health. I'm not sure how yeah. how effective that will be but uh, you can see on the women's side that a few players are now taking um, breaks like we have Muguruza then the Spanish player who's a Grand Slam champion she's taking time away from the court now due to mental health we had Naomi, Naomi Osaka a few years ago mm. citing mental health as the reason why she took a break you know we're seeing it more and more I think the demands of the, the tennis tour is really really huge on these players uh, and you know they're now deciding and it's good to see they're prioritising their mental health and, and looking after themselves first mm. What about on the women's side um, Schwantek obviously still alive uh, Coco Goff still alive who else do you like and how are they getting on at the moment do you think what's the so I I'm, I'm glad to see firstly that we have a bit of a rivalry going on in the women's game with uh, Ribikina Shiontek and Sabalenka I think Sabalenka is coming in hot now after winning um, Madrid although it's a bit of a different um, the clay in Madrid it's played at altitude the tournament so it's, it's much faster which suits her game but I like her chances on the bottom half of the draw Sabalenka uh, the top half with Shiontek and Ribikina that would be make for an interesting semi-final um, Goff obviously last year's finalist she's yeah. going to meet she Shantik in the quarterfinals so Shantik has a pretty tough road to the final having if she beats Goff in the quarter she then meets Ribikina. Um but there's there's been a good few matches a good com- few competitive matches uh, so far in the tournament that we've seen but I, I still will back Shantik to win so you think ideally we'll see them playing it out in quarterfinal semi-final so there's big games to look forward to yes. with the best players who've kind of established themselves over the last couple of years because we like we've talked repeatedly mm-hmm. about what happens in the um, post Serena world and we are here now yeah <laughs> and uh, you know there's a big opportunity for somebody to lay down a marker and like make an all time great name for yourself right? yeah I think Shantek is in the process of doing that anyway uh, since her dominance last year and um, since Ash Barty retired but it's great to see that these the likes of Sabalenka mm. and Rubikina are starting to to challenge her and she hasn't had much competition up till now but like you, the men's side we had the top three with Federer Djokovic and Nadal now we're kind of seeing you know the, these rivalries between Sabalenka and Rubikina and Shantek and hopefully this will be a, a rivalry that will push the, the game on even more in the coming years I was watching the the Coco Goff match yesterday um, Rebecca Masarova the Spaniard player, Spanish player that she beat mm. like she's still only 19 Coco Goff but she, she's not the finished article like I know she got to the final last year but even in that first set that she lost yesterday I think the commentators were pointing at her forehand wasn't where it should be yeah. so it, it, there's still issues there with her yeah, she's as I said, she's not the finished article yet. Um, she's still got a lot of a lot of parts of her games to polish. And um, but as she's nineteen, she's so much time for that. But at the same time, you know, she's shown great strides in terms of getting to the final last year. She has an amazing all round game. But her serve w- was a serve was a, a bit of an mm. issue last year, and then the forehand wasn't firing yet. This and hasn't been firing this yeah. year. All she hasn't had too many great results so far this year. Um, maybe your injury will heal by the time Wimbledon comes around. If you can get tickets for Wimbledon, <laughs> I've been doing anything to get Jacob's room if I could anyone listening please there you go That's, we, we're <laughs> officially sending the shout out and so uh, would you beat the best tennis player at off the ball left handed I presume that's Colin by the way I'm volunteering him here must 
be yeah. <laughs> we need we need to have an, an, Talks about an OTB hot, hot topic. bracket and then you would beat them left handed I, I, I'll play them right handed and I'll play them left handed how about right handed well, let's see you'll give them the benefit oh. of the both oh, she destroys no, humiliation yeah. no. yeah. we need to call Colm out in this one because he's been challenging me so oh, we play yeah, doubles okay, and he's not even here this yeah. is the perfect time to do it exactly. we should have doubles we should have two on one side and then it's yourself Jenny on the other side by yourself so okay. at least okay. give yeah, us we get American full, doubles we, we get the full doubles I'll let the three of you have it yeah go on yeah okay sounds great Jenny good stuff thanks a million it's 8.52 John Duggan is here John good morning to you Chair, Shane, Jenny, how are we all doing? You're excited, I presume. Uh, Vinny um, was in earlier on saying that he thinks that Ange is the man. Ange Postacogli, mate. You fly my mongrel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think it man- matters who the manager is, as I've said before. And I think ah, but this might be different. No, just when you were out, they just stuck ju- you back in. Just, just when you were, you thought it was all over. And eighty-three-year-old Al Pacino and his new kids. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What the hell? By the way, can we talk about that for a second? Al Pacino and Robert De Niro. Whatever you do, I'm doing. <laughs> I'm like, come on, lads. Yeah, the rivalry's over. That made me feel uneasy. It's very. It's not. It's. It's just. It's not. Eighty-three. You know, they can fix that these days. The poor kid. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. Anyway, uh, we got we got sidetracked. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, look, um, uh, Ange, uh, there's always the caveat of Brennan Rodgers and Steven Gerrard's experience in recent years in the Premier League. Um, I don't, to be brutally honest, watch enough of Celtic to give a really strong opinion, but it, it's pretty clear that from the, the top line that Ange Postacoglu is no nonsense. He plays attacking football. Um, he's had success in Australia, obviously managed the national team there and in Japan. And they, they're going for the treble against Inverness on Saturday, so... From that perspective, uh, you know, he does fit a certain criteria, but it's it's really hard to say how it'll work out once we see um, a higher altitude, if it is him. Plays great football, three yeah. up front. Scott, would have yeah. all of your attacking players on the field at the well, same time. You might play with Charles and Charles might score a goal. Uh, Scott Munn is the new technical advisor there at Tottenham and he's Australian as well, so maybe there's a link there already. Um, but I've got to say, reading the papers today, it sounds like everything has been sounded out yes they're not making an approach this time without some sense of the cost that there might be to he's only on a rolling deal as well if, yes look you know uh, look but I, I, I really do maintain now at this stage that Enoch have to sell the club um, for Tottenham to, to be re- revitalised and to have a new future and th- th- I wish them all the best and I, I really hope, hope they're the best time of their lives but let me posit a scenario right yeah Ange gets the job they start playing good football yep yeah. Harry Kane stays. Yeah, are you back in? I'm always in, but I but I'm but I'm a moaner, so um, it's 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 <laughs> all Spurs fans are though. It's the TV out the window every day. Um, but it's funny, like when somebody else lags off Spurs, I get kind of protective of it then. So um, I didn't like the ridicule. You don't want to become a, a, an object of ridicule if you have one of the best stadiums in the world, one of the best no, training grounds. <laughs> Just, one doesn't you, you know nobody wants to be the butt of everybody's joke and that's what Tottenham have become and that's what annoys me about the uh, leadership of the club that they're never held accountable for the decisions they make it's always the manager's fault or this or that and the recruitment there has not been good enough and once again I don't see Tottenham linked with any single player in the Premier League Chelsea are going through a massive sale of their players now Mount is going to United Kovacic could be going to Manchester City I don't see Tottenham linked with anybody and Arsenal and and Arsenal going to Liverpool Arsenal have a degree of um fizz about them at the moment whether they get Declan Rice or not or whoever they get there's a degree of um, excitement about Arsenal that Tottenham don't have and it's mad that Tottenham didn't sort this out ages ago because they had loads of time they had loads and loads of time they sacked Conte ages ago and actually the new manager and what his transfer targets would have been they could have they could have organised with Celtic backdoor channels we're going to take him because he's our number one guy you can have him to the end of the season we understand that's how football works we'd love a few phone calls with him just to check on some uh, transfer targets he can work for your transfer targets for next season we don't we will promise not to take anybody that's already on your board like there's loads of ways to do this in a way that's well run but to your point um, the days of Daniel Levy doing a great deal for um, value for money on the last day of the window are over like that's not the way I don't. I think it works anymore. It definitely doesn't. You know, it works the way Brighton and Leicester worked. Like Leicester, notwithstanding the fact that they went down, they built a yeah. great squad. Brighton and Brentford are, are two very well-run clubs, and Brighton are like Tony Bloom and the former uh, Spurs executive Paul Barber down there. That, that, that's the template you want to be using now. Maybe Daniel Levy will. Um, you know, learn from the mistakes that's been made uh, and, and we'll have a better future going forward and maybe there might be some investment that comes into the club because especially if Jim Ratcliffe takes over Manchester United but 
I just, I just uh, one trophy in twenty two years um, doesn't doesn't. Yeah. If Kane leaves, John, who who like who's a replacement for him? Like you look at the options where in world football at the moment, they're fairly limited. Yeah, but it might be that you don't have a like for like option and yeah. you play a different style. Yeah, and you'd hope they know more about the options of world football than we do. Yeah, you'd hope like. so. Um, but Tottenham have signed a lot of flops. Remember, yeah. even the bail money was wasted. The only kind of good player that came well, out that was Ericsson, really. It was ironic, wasn't it? Last night, Eric Lamella. Yeah, Eric nowhere. Lamella. Mm. No. Yeah, and he oh, took the penalty God. well. He took the penalty well. Six degrees of separation. The Rabona man. Gareth Bale. So, uh, Ireland play England at Lords this morning. Yes, um, I was looking through the website, the Lords website, and they've got so many food options. Uh, I, I, like, one of the things I would love to be doing now is either sitting lazily at Roland Garros uh, <coughs> or at Lords. Like, uh, just even one of the courts here, they have the duck, the grub shed, the flying cow, Chunky's pie and mash, Chunky's loaded burgers and fries, little Watan, whatever that is, uh, bring and bry, whatever that is as well, and the jerkyard. This is just paradise, really, isn't it? <laughs> Bring me the menu, sir. What? No, <laughs> yes. no, everything on the menu. Yeah. Um, I, no ripped jeans allowed, apparently. But you are allowed to wear jeans. No uh, ripped jeans. I mean, that's... But, yeah. At Lords. At Lords, yeah. I was, I've gone through. surprise me. Like uh, you are allowed to wear. I was, yes, sir, in this free country, we will allow you to wear <laughs> the clothes that you've purchased with your own money. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 11 o'clock start, uh, Josh Little arrested, but just be sitting there. I don't know if you've been to Cricket Lads. I was at the first ever... Um, Ball to be bowled in Ireland in Malahide in a test match in 2018 against Pakistan. I just love the whole concept of you watch a bit, you watch it maybe half an hour, an hour, then you kind of go wandering, have a drink, have a bit of food, and yeah, it's 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 a really good experience. This is a warm up for the Ashes. Yes, it is. Yeah, um, Ireland. I'm just on the Cricket Ireland website here. Uh, they've only played once before. Yes, in a, 2019 in a yeah. test match, and again, I'll be remembered for Tim Murtagh's outstanding five for 13 with the ball. Yeah, as England were bowled out for 85 on day one. I was like, I do. I, I wish I remembered more about that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's pre-COVID, isn't it? Uh, we, we've only played six tests. We've lost a lot. We're more of a limited overs team. But it's, it's like for Ireland to be playing a test match at all uh, in England is 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 a, is a definitely an achievement for the sport. Yeah, you know, we had George Dockerell, one of the Irish players in the studio last week. Week. Really fascinating guy as well, talking about the mental health supports Cricket Ireland have put in place for some of the players. I think it was, was it Philippe Clare's you had to be there episode where he f- honed in on two specific cricket moments or matches he was at. I was just mesmerised because it wouldn't be my, it's not my number one sport cricket but like the way Philippe Clare spoke about it I was like this man has convinced me here. I saw England West Indies and in you're never going to get allowed back into Malahan there Shane. 16 yeah, at Trent Bridge. Uh, I just remember it was just the Barmy Army were brilliant um, sitting down and I was too young to drink, have a drink whatever but there was this lad who just kept on going Did you say like, when you were 16 or in 2016 Cause I was like, when were, I was 16 ok sorry 1995 <laughs> went to Trent Bridge saw England against the West Indies and there was a lad in the crowd and he would go for drinks and the moment he got up off the chair the whole of the crowd would be going yeah go down come up with the drinks and the whole place just gone absolutely mental until he got back to his seat so that's the kind of stuff that it just goes off in w- weird directions and that because people are kind of bored and you know they're, they're into it for a while and then they're out of it and whatever and are you saying you weren't drinking because you were you're being responsible on air or was the World Cup in 1994 not the, the start of your drinking no I was only 15 then um, I didn't I didn't have a drink really until, until I was uh, just finishing school to be honest first ever drink was a Woody's Orange Oh, yeah. Woody's remember, orange. I remember the Woody's. Yeah. Uh, what the hell is that, lads? It's uh, alcoholic orange p- fizzy pops. It was like, oh, we're not marketing to children. We're just making uh, alcoholic fizzy drinks for grown-ups. Yeah, it's like vapes, cigarettes, colourful, uh, flavourful cigarettes. Do you remember where your first pint ever was? My first ever drink was. Uh, I'm almost ashamed to admit it. Um, I had uh, three cans of cider around a lake in Monaghan Town at the age of thirteen, fourteen. Jerry, would you remember it? Oh, I wouldn't recommend it. Obviously, drink responsibly and when you're overage. No, your first drink in the pub, though. First drink in the pub was probably 16, yeah, 16. What did you have? I think it just a pint of whatever the lager was. A pint of Tenants or Fosters or something. Fairly sure I had a Bailey's. <laughs> straight out, Whoa. Straight, out the, straight out the gap. I was like, I don't really like uh, most of these drinks that I've tried anywhere else. I'll have a Bailey's, please. <laughs> and uh, they served me. Jesus. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, first pint was in the didn't, mic- didn't you know? It didn't yeah. it didn't happen often after that. No, no, no. To, like, didn't go down great. Did you still drink it? Oh yeah, Christmas. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Didn't put you off. No, it definitely didn't put me off. 
Yeah, my first drink was of Guinness is in the Magic Harbor in Dublin, which no longer exists. Um, I just remember drinking and going, this tastes weird, but just keep drinking it and just pretend that everything is cool. You got there eventually. Uh, yeah, anyway, but right. responsibly. Right. Uh, OTBAM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave of your money back. Neon Art Edition is available now. John, good stuff. Thank All you right, lads, for that. All right, lads. Mind yourselves. Uh, now, time for the cash machine. Off the balls. Cash machine. So, May turned out to be one of our biggest months yet. We gave away over 620 grand to 15 winners. On Wednesday, though, somebody missed the opportunity. They didn't answer, which means we have a rollover. Best way, sorry, what better way to start the summer than with a lodgement to your bank account with more than 20 grand in it? Taking part is easy. Every day we give you a new amount. You take note of it, enter, and today at 3 o'clock, if we call and you give us the amount, you win the cash. If you've entered since 5 o'clock on Tuesday, don't worry, you're still in to win, but you need to know the new amount that I'm about to give you, so write it down with a pen and paper. Uh... 20,831 euros and 9 cents 20,831 euros and 9 cents and you need to text OTB and only OTB to 57557 if it's you we call after 3 o'clock make sure you answer within 5 rings tell us the prize amount and you win the money text OTB to 57557 cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play you've got to be over 18 you're playing across the Go Loud network full terms are on our website at offtheball.com get your entry in by 3 o'clock on Thursday that's uh, Thursday June 1st today it's 1st of June yeah uh, we could be calling you answer within 5 rings tell us the prize amount and the cash is yours 20,831 euros and 9 cents text OTB to 5 Seven five five seven. Reminder that you're uh, listening to this after three o'clock on Thursday. Don't enter unless you know the current cash ma- machine amount, as you will be charged and your entry won't be valid. Off the balls, cash machine. Right after the ads, John Bruin on last night's final. Back after these. You're listening to OTB AM. OCB GAA If I have a gym session I'm going out to the pitch with a bag of balls beforehand and after it like that I just love playing football so I can understand what was coming out of James Dunn at the weekend when he said we can't be celebrating this and he said ticky tacker is common Xavi and Iniesta you know tipping the ball back and forth Galway a lot further ahead than was common at this but was common as Jer said are going to do damage in this championship Subscribe to the OTB GAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Yeah, four minutes past nine on this uh, Thursday morning's OTB AM. I'm glad to turn back to football now. John Bruin, the football writer, joins us on the line. John, morning, how are things? I'm okay, lads. How are you? Keeping well, keeping well. Thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I know that the Europa League final last night was not one for the football purist, possibly. <laughs> but um, what, what was your general take on it? It was a, it was a bit bonkers. Uh, it was a dog of a game, wasn't it? It was really, really ugly. Um, who are we going to blame for this? <laughs> I've, I've got a good idea. Go on. Uh, I cast my mind back to 20 years ago, watching uh, th- this this same competition, though uh, it was called the UEFA Cup back then, uh, Porto versus Celtic, uh, another dog of a game, and who was the manager there uh, for Porto who won? Uh, also, um, speaking of, well, of Irishmen, uh, do you remember the... the uh, Cast your mind back to when Roy Keane stood on Vitor Bayer. Do you remember this incident? Oh, yeah. Uh, and he was sent off. Well, when Roy did that, I understood. Because that was Manchester United that night, as they were in the return leg, the famous one in which Jose Mourinho, let's name this guy, <laughs> uh, came to the fore, wound the opposition up, and uh, they uh, gamesmanship, we call it these days, don't we? Uh, there's another word that's used these days, but I'm not sure we can say it on your um, <laughs> at this time of the morning. Um, yeah, that's what it was all about. And the thing is, um, if we actually talk about the tactics, it appeared that once Paolo Dybala's, uh you know, sore muscles had run out, that was the plan. That was the plan. And it didn't go to plan because uh, in Sevilla, you've also got this... Alchemy, al- alchemical force <laughs> with this competition no matter who's the manager no matter who the players are put them in this position they could win this competition 
it just felt so far out, didn't it? That penalties were inevitable. I mean, as yeah, you said, that yeah. after the Bala goal, and then when Sevilla equalised, Sevilla have that period of pressure, but you just feel like penalties are, are always going to happen. Yes, yes, and of course, well, one of the reasons why it, it, it felt so long is that we had an almost record length uh, second period of added <laughs> extra time, didn't we? Did it? Did it go to? It nearly went to a half an hour, didn't it? It went on the, forever. It was a phony war. And, 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 and you know, um, this is a season, actually, isn't it, where there's been a lot of discussion over how much the ball was in play, and obviously the FIFA attacked it briefly uh, over in Qatar. Uh, but I mean, I haven't seen the stats, but how how the ball could not have been in play for more than 30% of that game at various points because there were just people lying around and, um, you know, every time you look, someone had a new muscle injury. And, of course, on the sidelines, uh, Jose Mourinho, who... Um, it used to be that he used to have... What was the guy's name that was his uh, assistant uh, at Chelsea that just had him as his attack dog? He now appears to have got an entire pack attack dogs to, to, to attack the referee um, and, and of course um, I'm sure you chaps have seen the footage this morning um, waiting under the stadium the Ferenc Pushkas Stadium for Anthony Taylor giving him a bit in the car park I mean that's like Sunday League stuff isn't mm. it you know chasing the referee down the, uh, into his car um, yeah welcome the, the funny thing is uh, I think at a distance, quite a few people, including myself, have looked at Jose Mourinho in Rome uh, and seen the devotion that many of the fans have to him. And maybe we've not watched enough Serie A. Uh, and we've thought, maybe this guy's changed. <laughs> and yeah. do you know what? We were completely and utterly wrong. This is Jose Mourinho. This is what it was. This is what uh, he reduced uh, European football to uh, in the mid-2000s. This is why... Um, OK, Chelsea played some decent football under him. But when he left English football that first time, back in 2007, a dark cloud was lifted off English football. And uh, he's been back since, of course. but um, And he's never been able to cast the same spell. But that initial spell of, you know, gamesmanship, of, um, you know, referee baiting, of... Um, doing anything but all costs of um, having actually no respect for his own reputation mm. of you know of lying okay the Dibbler thing you know saying he's going to saying Dibbler might not be fit to play everyone knows that Dibbler's going to play come on let's, let's not be stupid here <laughs> and, 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 and the, all this stuff is the Jose Mourinho remembered leopards don't change their spots uh, I'm glad we've had him in the game it's been great to have a villain I'm amused to see that uh, PSG are linked with his signature quite heavily I, I, my only instinct there is that they want a wrecking ball in there um, and my great wish actually uh, of Jose Mourinho is that he does come back to the Premier League and comes back to Chelsea just to complete that particular comedy act as well <laughs> um, I, I think we need this guy just for one last turn he's certainly a story uh, Rui Faria was that attack dog that he, that's the guy yeah, yeah 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 funny yeah, that, that incident last night I mean Mourinho was the attack dog when he came to, to Anthony Taylor and seeking him out as you said underneath, underneath the stadium as, as Taylor was, was going to get his his, uh, his lift home I guess Um that does that sort of thing you reckon put Mourinho out of some clubs minds like the likes of PSG or other clubs being linked with Jose Mourinho look at that and go oh yeah I forgot this is this is what he brings this is what he's like yeah I think actually there has been this idea that uh, in Rome he's played a little bit better, fo better football um, and in and also uh, Rome, Rome are a club that have never won much in their time despite being such a big club Winning the Conference League uh, did seem to refresh Mourinho himself, uh, and it did appear to refresh his reputation. I think there was a lot of happiness, you know, when he when he got out that silly tattoo and stuff like that. And just thinking, you know, because there is a, there is a there, there is almost a, a fun element to to Mourinho. The problem is that you've always got to be laughing with him. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's very much on his terms. But yeah, I wonder. And it, it speaks to the disorganisation of a club like PSG that they might consider Mourinho, mm -hmm. that they might forget that all the baggage, baggage that comes with him. Because 
Yeah, I mean, you know, they're run by, uh, you know, essentially owned by the, the Qatari royal family, uh, who, you know, as we found in the last year, take their reputation very seriously in a world Do you want this guy at your club? You know, because the other thing is, you employ someone like that, and he turns his guns on you, as he did, say, on Daniel Levy, as he's done on Daniel Levy in, in recent weeks, as he's done on Chelsea in the past. Um, you know, yeah, I think uh, that probably wasn't the best job application I've seen. It was it was the the gesturing and the gesticulating as well on the bench that that nobody was really surprised at, but maybe the the extent of it, John, people were surprised at. Like, yeah. I don't know how many yellow cards was a thirteen or fourteen given out in all, and so many members of that Roma bench and coaching team and Mourinho himself gets in on the act and gets one just before it goes to penalties. Like, quite ridiculous. Every single decision that that was made across the, across the course of the hundred twenty plus minutes, uh, and Roma and and their players have clearly been trained to to do this it's remarkably ridiculous it is and that's not that's not a squad without talent either they've got good players um you know uh they've they they, yeah it's interesting is it and you actually look at all those teams to to which to whom uh Mourinho is reduced to that that Porto team back in 2003-4 hugely talented team brilliant players Chelsea, mid two thousands, you know, um Damien Duff among them, great talent in that team. Mm. Come on. And yet that's the thing with Mourinho. They've always got that bearing that scar, that that stamp of Mourinho. And, you know, he was at Manchester United. Funny enough, actually, I don't recall much of that type of behaviour at Manchester United. No. Which is weird, isn't it? Because uh, we it's almost as if the, the later period Mourinho has recovered the zest of his early career uh, and yet the mid part of the career um, that we saw I mean actually at Chelsea, at Chelsea's second time out there was a bit of that stuff there was the, the winding up of the opposition obviously there was the Stephen Gerrard slip in which you know he put on this performance of pretending to be ill before the game turned up completely unshaven uh, I was at, at that match actually and afterwards he uh, when a journalist asked whether he'd been um, ill, he breathed on him and said, now you'll see whether I was ill or not, you know, to, to say <laughs> to spread his germs. Um, he, you know, it's he, always been a great character for that type of thing. But yeah, actually, Manchester United uh, and Spurs, did we see enough of that guy? Maybe there wasn't enough. Maybe there was that's a, that's a mid-career sag. <laughs> and now, moving into his 60s, he's just thinking... Let's just go for it. And maybe with a lesser group of players, he might think lesser group of players, he sees that as the route to victory. He doesn't see any great tactical plan or anything like that. We know what our Mourinho tactics are. Um, and a big part of those tactics are the gamesmanship. Yeah, of course, he, he just turned 60 in January, Jose Mourinho as well. So maybe he decided at 60 he's going to get back to those uh, old days of his youth and, and he had that quiet <laughs> period in between. Potentially, you even saw him throwing the, the, the runners-up medal into the crowd last night, perhaps to, to no one's surprise after the ceremony. It's just one of those one of those Jose things. I enjoyed your tweet last night, John, as well. Um, if there's any kids watching the Europa League final tonight, this is what top-level European football often looked like in the mid-2000s. And so right you were. Like The only thing that probably brought it back to the modern age was the Sevilla player walking up and kissing the trophy with their phones in hand and taking their little selfies and, yeah. and all the rest so that's probably the only thing that modernised it but certainly from a footballing perspective it did feel something of old didn't it? Yeah I think I, I think so I think there's always been the mid 2000s was a, actually quite a dark period of, of, of football because I suppose you came from uh, the, the 90s I suppose you know think of it from an English perspective obviously you had a, Manchester United were always there and they were about so they weren't that great at that put period um, the Liverpool team that won that tie the, in Istanbul no disrespect Liverpool fans you know it not a great team um, and then you had the sort of fading of Milan a, a, around this time and so the teams that came through were were teams like like Mourinho's Porto and, and Chelsea uh, and I'm sure all of us remember those games between Benitez's uh, Liverpool and Mourinho's Chelsea uh, I mean obviously there were a couple of semi-finals but there was also the um, they were drawn in a group together don't you remember that I mean well yeah. no, one, no one could possibly remember anything from those games I think both of them were nil-nil but you know just this awful awful football um, in which 
uh, I suppose at that point, um, winning at all costs became the uh, became the key to it. And you know, uh, we should be very thankful to Pep Guardiola for many reasons. And one of them is that the Barcelona team, um, and actually just before that, the, the Frank Rijkaard team, maybe of uh, Barcelona came through and showed that there is a different way of playing the game, and that's what's been so influential over that that last fifteen years. And that's the style of play. And then we had the German model that came in with Jurgen Klopp. Um, and that's changed the way that the matches are played and are played at much um, higher tempo. Uh, there's more focus on winning the game the proper way. And uh, yeah, the, the mid-2000s was that sort of morass of, of gamesmanship, of, uh, of controversial refereeing decisions, of you know referees becoming notorious, of referees being menaced in the case sometimes of Chelsea. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't yearn back for that era. And as I say, in English football, it did feel that when Mourinho left first time out, there was a there was something of a uh, a dark cloud lifted. Uh, but that dark cloud's in Italy now for mm. the moment. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of a uh, there's a bit. Of, I know you're a Succession fan. There's a bit of Logan Roy off Jose Mourinho at the moment. Um, Absolutely, yeah. likability. <laughs> They're up there together. Uh, John, as well, we should touch on, on these Ange Postacoglu to Spurs rumours. Yes. They seem to be a little bit more than than rumours, if you're to believe the, the newspapers this morning. But um, certainly the, the talk being that after the Scottish Cup final this Saturday that uh, Spurs will certainly ramp up their interest in Ange Postacoglu. Seems like a, a good fit football-wise. Is it a move that you expect Ange to make? Yeah, yeah it was put to me over the weekend that... Um what what Tottenham don't want to do is have a Nuno situation, and I think you know what I mean by that. Which was you know you wait sixty days or, or whatever it was over a summer, and appoint Nuno Espirito Santo. Now, great to respect, good manager. I believe he's doing well in Saudi Arabia, but uh, that's not what Spurs fans want. And and well, it could be box office. And the other thing is, he's doable as well, and I think that's part of it, and that's why. Uh, um, through uh, you know various connections in the game, they've been able to get through to that to him. Um, I think uh, it's very sad for Celtic um, that they were going to. It's been such a great figure for them, hasn't he? He's really transformed them. Uh, uh, you know, and it's <laughs> he's going to be a credit to the Premier League when he comes down as well. Um, and uh, you know, totally beloved back in Australia. I remember when he came over to to Celtic speaking to a few colleagues over there and they just said you know really love the guy just hope it works out because you're going to love him too and uh, <laughs> funny enough there's a guy with a, a sunny disposition a positive outlook about football and uh, you know compare that to the managers that Spurs have had recently um, obviously Antonio Conte well he made his feelings known about Tottenham mm. uh, and uh, the football Tottenham played under him obviously and he succeeded uh, with the aforementioned Jose Mourinho um, listen I I'm not sure that Ange Postacoglu is going to be um, you know the, the new uh, Pochettino or anything like that but I think he might be a manager that brings a bit of a smile a bit of cheer the other factor is of course that my expectation is that he won't have Harry Kane to deal with because Harry Kane will have left the club um, he'd also expect perhaps that someone like Harry Kane would look at someone like Ange Postacoglu and think okay uh do I want to work with this guy? He might be a bit below the elite level that Harry Kane wants to work with. That might be a, a mistake on Harry Kane's part. So he's got a rebuilding job to do if he goes in. Yeah. Uh, and there is a hell of a lot of rebuilding to do at, at, at Tottenham. Um, because uh, I mentioned Pochettino, obviously he's going to Chelsea. The amount of players or the amount of people still around the club that were back there in that sort of peak Poch era is really quite jarring. Uh, you know, Eric Dyer is still in the team and with the greatest respect, you would have thought things have moved on from there. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I'm all for Ange going in there. I think that's going to be a good appointment. It's going to be an interesting appointment. <laughs> um, and the feeling I get from, from the Spurs fans is, yeah, it's something different. It's something to be positive about. And, you know, the, a guy with that element of charisma 
that's a good thing as well because the other thing is if you're Daniel Levy um, I mean I go to Spurs quite a lot um, any time Tottenham concede a goal <laughs> the fans start singing about Daniel Levy <laughs> right so they need someone a front man who is not uh, who's going to bring a sunny disposition that means that the club is focused away from turning on Daniel Levy because that's that is a big part of the problem with the club whether Daniel Levy is the problem uh, behind why the club has underachieved I, I, I'm not I'm not sh- I'm not so sure because I think he's done a good job in several uh, circumstances or some, several spheres uh, but someone needs to lift the positivity of that club and and fits the bill for me for that yeah and I, I guess a lot of it as you say depends on Harry Kane's future where do you expect Harry Kane to be playing his football next season John I suppose he is being linked to, to clubs outside the Premier League but within the Premier League I guess Manchester United the obvious option I, th- I don't think there's anybody else really is that I mean okay we, we could we could play Todd Bowley ball uh, <laughs> uh, Liverpool unlikely Liverpool appear to have their wings clipped out at transfer target wise anyway uh, but I don't see him as you know that they've got you know a, a rack of strikers um, yeah maybe I, I suppose one one outsider and it could be one of those things in which uh, is a demonstration of Saudi power is that Newcastle go for him and say if you want to beat Alan Shearer's record you do it in Alan Shearer's shirt <laughs> um, but that seems unlikely because I think uh, it, it, as as much criticism as Saudi Arabia's ownership of or co-ownership of Newcastle has received, uh, I think they've been pretty careful about the the uh, FFP stuff, um, and I don't think they're going to go hugely over budget. They have got Alexander Isak, they have got Callum Wilson. Um, obviously, Harry Kane will be an upgrade on on, on at least Wilson. But yeah, Manchester, what's the club that's glaring for a striker? What's the club that you watch every week and think, if only I had a striker to slot that in? <laughs> That's Manchester United, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, it's, it, it has to be done. And it, it, uh, uh, the mood music from Kane, uh, he does a lot of public sp- stuff at, at, at Spurs, you know, speaking before the game and um, spoke after the, after the season. At, at no point <laughs> has it appeared that he's willing to commit to Spurs uh, and the future there. Yeah, and of course it will remain to be seen what the the ownership situation at Manchester United looks like. Jim Ratcliffe appears to be in the the driving seat for now, anyway. But, yeah, yeah. Um, finally, John, the the Mason Mount to Manchester United appears ever closer. Seems to have agreed personal terms with the club. If you're to believe some reports in the media this morning, uh, a good signing for United if that goes ahead. I think so. Yeah, uh, I think um, by the sounds of it, Eric Tan Hag is very taken with him. Uh, and if you're a Manchester United fan so far you'd have to trust Ten Hag's judgement on the players he's brought in um, give or take Valt Horse, bless him <laughs> uh, but you know we could we could see what what was attempted there um, yeah I, I suppose my only concern with Mount is there is a bit of a there's a bit of a bit of a catch a falling star thing really because Two years ago, he was a very important player when England would you know, reach the Euros final, um, and um, he is one of those players that within the game has had a growing reputation. Obviously, he had the patronage of uh, Frank Lampard at Derby at Chelsea, um, but he struggled beyond that. He struggled. Uh, I mean, Tuchel obviously, yeah, made him an important player as well. I think there's been injuries. I think he's been a bit tired by having to play almost every game for a long time. Um, and the other thing is, you can't really blame anybody uh, for getting lost amid what's happened at, at Chelsea. Um, I think we're going to see a few players maybe leave that club and shine at other clubs because they are so talented. Um, and I don't see why Mount shouldn't be one. And, and, and the issue, of course, with Mount is I would expect that Mount was quite happy to remain a Chelsea player, was happy to sign the new deal. But when uh, the, the new ownership came in and decided to... Well, they decided that they knew better. And they knew how to reconfigure the transfer market. So they would sign players on eight-year deals and offer them uh, contracts that were, um, say, let's say mid-market level uh, for, for a Premier League player over those deals if you were Mason Mount and you've been a star player of England's uh, run to the Euros final you've been a star player 
in Chelsea winning the Champions League, you don't want mid-market money and you don't want to sign an eight-year eight, eight deal. Uh, if you want to make enough money from your career, you want you want to move up to the, you know, 200,000, 300,000 bracket. If Chelsea aren't going to offer him that, and that appears to be the case, then Mason Mount has to leave the club. And I think uh, a lot of Chelsea fans would be very sad to see a player who, let's see, you know, Mason Mount could conceivably be Chelsea's captain for the next almost decade or so. Mm. But uh, that appears to have not been the case and they've let him go. Um, my only concern is, is sometimes players don't transfer so well when they move you know, from north to south but we've seen it at Manchester City that uh, in particular that's not been so much of a problem uh, so let's see and you know <laughs> he'll be living in that, that great big footballers enclave in Cheshire <laughs> uh, where they all live these days and um, I'm sure he'll be quite happy there um, but yeah a good player um, not sure he is uh, say the Frankie de Young level that I think Ten Hag wanted back uh, when he started I, I'm sure they might try and pursue that one as well uh, but you're getting Mason Mount you're getting Harry Kane you get a decent full back say and you get a goalkeeper the Manchester United have had a strong summer uh, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if you and I were talking uh, at the end of August and they still haven't signed Harry Kane and uh, they've only signed a couple of players because as you say this ownership question uh, does um, hang very heavy over what Manchester United are going to do. Absolutely. Uh, John, really interesting stuff as always. Thanks many for hopping on this morning. No problem. Uh, really enjoyed it. Cheers. Brilliant stuff. John Bruin there, football writer, of course. Always interesting chats with uh, with John. Kathleen McNamee has joined me back in studio. Kathleen, how are things? I'm very good. How are you? Keep it well. The big seat suits you as well. I know. I do enjoy the big seat. I was hosting, was it two weekends ago now? And I was sitting here and I was like, oh, you can oh. feel the power. <laughs> it is, it is. There's power in that seat. Yeah. The, the temptation to stop yourself or to swing on it, though, is far too much. You yeah. kind of have to like mentally say to yourself, don't swing in the seat. Don't There's swing in the seat. Yeah. It definitely is the most comfortable seat. Which, oh, yeah, which definitely. tells you about the power in that seat. <laughs> you know, 100%. Um, I did want to mention as well the F1 pod, which started yesterday. So we had our first episode. Um, really fascinating chat. So it's episode one. It's a new new thing we're trying. Uh, there's going to be 18 episodes between now and the end of the season. David Kennedy, the former Irish Formula 1 driver from Sligo, no less. I know. I loved listening to that, actually. Yeah. I hadn't known that much about him until I saw he was on the podcast and I saw he was from Sligo. And I was like, oh. yeah. He was a really talented driver. Like Formula Three, and, and uh, he had a short enough career in Formula One back in in the early eighties. But mm. uh, still, some serious experience. Like he's he's driven around that track in Monaco. So to have him on the episode yesterday was brilliant. And Rebecca Clancy, of course, the motor correspondent for the Times and the Sunday Times, was on with us as well, talking Max Verstappen's performance in Monaco last week or last weekend. Uh, preview in the Spanish Grand Prix this weekend, and Fernando Alonso's performances so far this season. Rumors of Lewis Hamilton to Ferrari, which Rebecca poured a bit of cold water on yesterday. But you get the podcast in. Uh, in all the usual spots um, and it was really fascinating so it's around 45 or 50 minutes in duration just stick it on your car journey whatever else And Is it going to be around all the Grand Prix or will there be like previews reviews? Yeah we'll kind of do We'll it'll be every Wednesday so mostly race weeks I know there are a couple of gaps in between but some of those gap weeks we'll kind of do little bits and bobs mm. uh, the best tracks to, to go to as a fan the, the favourite sporting or Formula 1 documentaries and books and that sort of thing so we'll create a few episodes as well um not to rival the Koi gig pod, of course. Oh, of course to, not. To be, to be of course not. Symbiotic <laughs> in, re, in its relationship. Um, are you heading to any of the guys this weekend? Uh, no, sadly not. I don't think so. I actually think I might be in here doing ah. steering the ship a little bit on right. Sunday. So I'll be checking in on all the guys that's happening. But I'm not. You're heading to the Monaghan game? Heading to Monaghan, Claire, and Clonus, uh, which I'm excited about. It's funny that you know, all of a sudden, if you get something out of your first game, as Monaghan and Sligo both mm -hmm. did, you're all of a sudden thinking, right, well... <laughs> we can do more. something here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one more win from your remaining two games and you're absolutely through to something. Yeah. And some guys, you'll, you'll finish second or third, probably. Well, even for like Sligo at the moment, it's basically just keep the score lines down against Roscommon in Dublin and because it's probably yeah. going to come down to points difference. For sure. Unless there's some strange result. I don't know, like Kildare managed to do something against Dublin. Which, which I wouldn't rule out. 
Not yeah. completely, but I feel like they're going to be annoyed after the Roscommon game, and especially the whole narrative around it that you know Roscommon played them at their own game and were better at it. Like that's going to get under the dub skin completely. The wounded beast that is Dublin. Yeah, it's funny because Jer was a couple of weeks ago very much of the of the mind that Dublin were the favourites for the All Ireland, but mm. has rolled back completely. <laughs> like yesterday in the power rankings with Tommy, anyone who saw it. Yeah, certainly a rollback, but I can see that because the Dublin's performances. People keep saying this, oh, they need to. You know they're going to peak at the right time, yeah. but they're not really. I think you have to be peaking around now to to have any chance. That's not to say that they won't come good in the next couple of games. Yeah, but certainly if you're only scoring one eleven uh, in Croke Park, that's not very Dublin esque. So well, it is interesting the narratives around say like the bigger teams, like the result that Mayo had against Kerry, and everyone's like, yeah, no, this is exactly the time that Mayo, you know, need to be turning the gears and getting into things. And then with Kerry in Dublin, everyone's like, ah, oh, no, they still have a bit of time. They, you know, they might take a few more weeks and they'll be fine. They'll definitely do a run then. And it's just funny how like if Mayo hadn't have done it, <laughs> what would we be saying? about them now yeah we're always waiting for this run to happen uh, it hasn't just happened just yet uh, should mention as well the news coming in from the, the cricket I know John was talking about the, the mm. food and the menu of the cricket uh, the England team have been delayed by a Just Stop Oil protest en route to Lords, Lords. so that's a possible delay to the start of that cricket against Ireland so yeah the Just Stop Oil causing some um issues yeah, at various I, sporting events yeah it's Epson this weekend as well there's supposed to be yeah. protests at that too right um, I saw the chief talking about it and he was kind of imploring them not to protest and I always think it's funny when people come out and say these things I was like you're kind of almost just baiting them into actually doing it yeah there was a stoppage at a uh, rugby match the weekend of the premiership final mm. in England had had an issue the weekend and of course the the untouchable snooker at the crucible <laughs> not too long ago was absolutely destroyed in one of those it was probably days. one of the most dramatic ones as well oh because you can hear it's funny you can hear the crowd as well when the, yeah. when the person certainly the, the referee Olivia Martel on one table stops the woman from getting onto the table I think she tries to handcuff herself or tie herself to the one of the pockets uh, but then the guy obviously on the other table caused absolute carnage in that match between Joe Perry and, and Robert Milkins and just orange powder or dried mm. paint I think it was over the table completely such an iconic photo oh it's, it's an amazing yeah. photograph it just contrasted with the green table and you're like this is fantastic and the darkness of the room as well and yeah oh, just something else and you can hear the people in the crowd swearing at the guy on the, on the table <laughs> as well because obviously they can't they can't you don't the want to annoy snooker officiating oh animals. listen if there's one sport that is untouchable <laughs> leave it be uh, please but uh, on that note 9.33am on this uh, Thursday morning thank you Kathleen for no everything thank this you, morning uh, out to BM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back in the online edition available now on tomorrow's show Gilly Flaherty will preview the Champions League final looking forward to that one this weekend Daniel Harris will look ahead to the first ever Manchester Derby FA Cup final hard to believe Alan Quinlan on the Ireland squad uh, the Friday fire pit and plenty more besides right now here is some highlights from last night's football show have a tremendous Thursday you're welcome along football show is upon us Sam McDonald of the Irish Independent is here in the studio you're very welcome thank you Joe Dan wearing shorts everybody yeah feeling feeling sort of a bit of a summery vibe though it wasn't actually as warm as I was expecting what is the etiquette in shorts in the office for a man well, those hairy legs. <laughs> well, what, like, what, what would your policy be? Uh, Do you have like a, tra- a temperature threshold? It's like twenty-five uh, plus. It's acceptable. I don't have a policy. I don't think. I like. You know, I think there is a. I mean, there are Irish people who will wear shorts at any opportunity. That's definitely become more of a thing now. Mm-hmm. Like it could be like ten degrees, and you're wearing shorts. Whereas, in my defence, playing a bit of seven or Astro today. God, he's of, sweaty as well. He yeah. hasn't showered. But no, it's just like after that, it's like you're not going to get into like because it was meant to be a bit warmer than it actually is. But okay. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'm comfortable in my skin, Joe. Okay, good, 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 yeah. good. I thought it was a statement, but uh, I didn't yeah. think it was a statement. It was, it was, more, <laughs> it was more, more laziness, really, as much as anything. You know, we have um, rubber stamped, I think, at this stage, our goodbye to the Premier League season that was with Gav Cooney and last night and Pat Nevin on the uh, football show on Monday. So FA Cup final is taking centre stage. It is a Manchester derby for the first time in the history of the competition, which is quite something. Yeah, yeah that is mad actually. But then I suppose yeah, you have these glitches like that happen. Like for example, a home here, like I mean it's this much smaller league and smaller I don't think Bows and Rovers have played in a cup final or they have maybe back in the twenties or thirties and you think, how the hell has that happened? Like, Pats and Bows a couple of years back had never played in a cup final and like, the league is so small you think surely this would have happened. And I know England is obviously much bigger more clubs but it's and Man City have been yeah. in the doldrums but it's 
slightly unusual. It doesn't happen. Everton Liverpool had a couple of goals at it in the 80s. Mm. You know, so... Mm. There are narratives uh, plenty to use that great word. Uh, so City hoping to emulate Manchester United's 99 treble and the 2023 version of Manchester United with a chance to ruin the party. It is a three o'clock kickoff. Very traditional. Uh, three o'clock kickoff for the first time in 12 years. That's good. Yeah, until you read the reason is that the police said you really need to have an early kickoff here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. is that, I wonder was it something to do with trains as well? I think there were issues before with that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think it's a. Uh, listen, no harm if there's not an extra three hours spent drinking. Uh, was it was some of the advice apparently? Ah, because I think the Epsom Derby, the racing has started like half one this Saturday as a contra- as a consequence of this. Yeah, that is true. So uh, Martial is out for Manchester United, which scuppers Wayne Rooney's plan in the Sunday Times at the weekend. He was very much recommending uh, two banks of four. Don't really budge from your positions, but to have two split strikers who cheat was his uh, phrase. Mm. Uh, basically, it's the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, uh, blueprint they were all his best performances um, Rooney harking back to the days of Duff and Robin and saying those guys sometimes would cheat and it was very distracting when you were trying to attack and you knew that they were just lurking on the half turn uh, behind you so he was saying that's the best way to go about taking on a City so he was saying Rashford and, and Martial who knows how Manchester United will go about their business but um, I guess it's one of those things you make City pretty firm favourites but it's not inconceivable it's not inconceivable. What's your okay? Just to play not to have his advocate, but what's what's the main reason to believe Manchester United will win? One off occasion, a certain pressure comes on treble chasing Manchester City. Mm. The game is still in the mix with twenty minutes to go. Yeah, like United score an early goal, etc. It becomes one of those games where yeah, the, you start well and you suddenly get into a position and the magic happens yeah I like I mean you can see it you know you, you can see that um, but then like you do have memories of games in recent memory where they've been blown away by Lost. City yeah and it's hard to I just think like City have, have been able to sort of win the league with a couple of games to spare you know, it's a week till the Champions League final it's not like you know when it used to be a was it was 99 a cup final on a Saturday and a Champions League final on a Wednesday and sure that type of thing it's um, what per Nicky Butt was told son yeah. you're my only fit centre midfielder who can play on Wednesday you're not playing today yeah. Skulls and Keane obviously suspended yeah so like it feels like it's nicely balanced in such a way that the, dis- the distraction angle isn't viable yeah. you know that's that's not a runner at all um, and I don't think the pressure angle either I mean if they can handle the pressure of Real Madrid of all teams coming to the Etihad very much in the mix uh, all the pressure that goes with that Champions League situation I think they can handle this I, think, well, I, I do think there's going to be pressure on the inter game the Champions League I think that's their only enemy in that match is this, the symbolism of winning the Champions League that sort of mental block like that is a game where Inter Milan definitely I know we're jumping ahead yeah. but like, that is a game where it is the classic just stay in the game yeah. just stay in the game because you can you know you can sort of play tricks on their mind if you can sort of maintain that that this one but I think this is the thing like okay they want to win the treble sure but it and, and I'm not saying it's not to be all and end all either but I feel like it's just it's a it's a good occasion for yeah. City no you know? I know what you mean it's a really interesting two games so you'd say on balance they're definitely better than both of their opponents they're accustomed to handle the pressure it's just it's two games where opponents who are pretty high level are going to dig in in a very committed defensive way and make this tough for you and over 180 minutes across the two games that gets a bit sticky like I don't think Manchester United are going to come out and play ball or take any risks whatsoever it will be something akin to what Rooney talked about yeah. and I think Inter will do similar and so when you're City that's oh, we're it's a bit a, of a grind a breakaway goal here from being behind the eight ball so it's fascinating how it's all laid out gun to my head I think they'll blitz both of them. Really? Yeah. I feel like they'll they'll win comfortably on Saturday. I do think they'll win the Champions League. I just feel like there's a story in that game. Mm. You know, I just feel it just could be more complicated than than people think. And then like, you know, maybe like a lot of this see isn't really football analysis, it's just a hunch. Yeah. You know, based on on a sort of a mental some kind of like the the the, the type of thing where you talk about like how, how teams are, are you know are battling. And like City's history in the Champions League to be fair lends itself to that. You know, like inexplicable defeats at various times. Um I, I just don't know. Like, like, I suppose there is this debate 
I mean, it's probably a general Premier League season review theme like Manchester United came third. It's a very good season. How good do they need to be to finish third? Mm. You know, like this is the thing, you know, what is the value of third place in this season where a lot of the teams they finished ahead of that they were behind last year were like all over the shop? Yeah. You know, like what, like, and I don't know the answer to that question. Like, I mean, they, they obviously had periods of the season where they looked very good. Yeah. Sort of tailed off a little bit towards the end, you know, the European sort of exit. And you're sort of looking at it now going, I mean, yeah, like, okay, I mean, the, you know, Liverpool had a bit of a run, Newcastle no one expected them to be ready this year Spurs were a joke Chelsea were a joke mm. I mean Brighton like Brighton really could have had a run at the top four if they'd almost been you know, they had this bad backlog of games and they had a couple of crazy results as, as mad as that sounds Brentford aren't too far off it yeah. you're sort of thinking yeah they've turned the corner and there is a belief but like there is I mean that just leads you to the impression that I mean when it came down to it Man City blew away Arsenal and like why wouldn't they do it no. in this game here they're ruthless uh, Pep Guardiola winning the LMA Manager of the Year award for the third time during the week Ferguson on stage Gert Seke on stage Pep over in Barcelona guys I can't turn up I can't turn up every year for this so he accepted it that way it was kind of interesting when with Ferguson next to him I thought because remember the debate was raging about a month ago who's had the more profound effect on football mm. was Ferguson an innovator in the way Guardiola is maybe not and it was interesting Kelly Cates was interviewing Seke on stage next to Ferguson and she was asking him about the effect Guardiola has had on English football or the English players he's managing and he was talking about how oh you know and he's right next to Ferguson for this like he was saying the dads in this country I'm sure the mums as well he meant but the dads in the country the coaches of underage football they were all watching Pep's Barcelona 10 years ago in brackets when they were hockeying Alex's Manchester United yeah. but they were watching that team and so they saw that this is the way football should be played and so it's infiltrated down to underage like over a decade ago and that's why we have the players we have now in a sense which was a really interesting comment that even Southgate is looking at the technicians in English football now and I'm sure structures are a big part of it but he reckons even the weekend warrior dads who were coaching the under eights were watching Barcelona hammering Manchester United in Champions League finals and saying let's play more like them yeah there is a, yeah there there is, there is something I mean there's like a broader debate here and I don't like, I, I think I don't have the evidence to sort of talk about it but but anecdotally from speaking to people involved in the game that I think there's probably an, an impact on the type of players that are being produced as well too the little lad the little technicians yeah and that's why someone like Evan Ferguson is like a really big deal in England because they look at an old school number nine like in some ways and he's not quite old school but there's not a huge amount of them and like even look at the centre halves in the England team that's why Harry Maguire endures you know and and like there's that's even there's a debate here at home around that that like we have a certain stereotype of the Irish players but even that under 17 team that are away a lot of the exciting players are the front players yeah. you know and there's no doubt that the way like teams are being coached and playing the game and the you know the the style of player um, you know the, the, the tactical stuff the false nines and, and various sort of uh, the, uh, tactical innovation is like there's, there's it feels like there's a production line of a lot of similar type of players and, and not in some other departments of a certain quality yeah, but look sure. at, maybe you need a longer sample size over like a longer period of time yeah. um, but people will say sometimes that the Premier League Academy system um, is amazing um, but there's there's a debate around that actually like clearly it's like because there's so much money it's developing some great players like Foden and people like that but is it actually fully efficient in terms of maximum output there's, there's conflicting views on that well I think the famous line was that Diego Simeone blames Guardiola for the lack of Diego Costa's available mm. which is um, yeah. a line from a couple of years ago I'll be honest though Dan I know we were thinking the same thing if only Wes was coming through 10 years oh, ago it'd be God. a different story in that yeah. career it really is I mean there's going to be a lot of I, like, I mean, I, sometimes you just won't say things to, to that they age well in the future but like there's going to be a lot of excitement I think about Andrew Moran who plays for Brighton in the next couple of years um, who is um, a young kid but one Premier League appearance this year now he might go on loan next year but they've given him a four year deal but I remember speaking to someone in Brighton a couple of years ago 
about Andrew Moore and there's there's a shade of Wes but they said he's almost more Spanish than Irish in terms of his style in terms of how he plays um, I remember watching him in a friendly pre-season friendly for Bray Wanderers a couple of years ago it's kind of mad pre, pre-COVID and then with the lockdown he just ended up going straight to England rather than playing that season at home here and he was like 15, 16 but I'm just telling you just just wait give it a couple of years that's who you're going to be talking about in that in that position I'm okay with definitely. that definitely but Wes no Wes was just retired like under the radar completely yeah. just slipped away but it is true if you come along now a lot of teams underage level now in Ireland if you watch them they have a, a Wes type operator yeah interesting uh, case this week just to note uh, the specifics of which are important to varying degrees but um, five men have uh, been sentenced to a combined 30 years very much not 30 years each but still 30 divided by five men is on average six years in prison mm. which is not nothing to say the very least and this is after the Premier League brought about a historic private prosecution to clamp down on the illegal streaming of matches so in the male online for instance there, there's photos of rather glum looking perpetrator sitting on his couch and then pictures of the what looked like 15 black little boxes with wires everywhere as he was um, uh, beaming out uh, football matches and sport to uh, subscribers this is the really interesting thing about illegal streaming is that people are also paying subscriptions to illegal channels it's not, you know a lot like I know people in my world I, they were paying oh yeah I, I pay a subscription to an illegal um, yeah. broadcaster so um, fans using TV sticks to illegally stream Premier League matches uh, very unlikely to face prosecution was the uh, line from authorities so of these five gentlemen their income came through three uh, streaming organisations which offered illegal access to content including live Premier League matches uh, so they generated £7 million between 16 and 21 Hmm. So if you think, oh, I wonder if these streaming sites, are they getting by at all? Seven million generated between 16 and 21, which is quite something. And apparently um, in the UK, a thousand individuals received letters in effect saying, please stop using these streams, but uh, nobody likely to be uh, prosecuted. So that was an interesting case from the UK. They're going after them. I... Uh, I, I don't know how hopeless their um, cause is. I'm not sure how many of these sites there are. I'm not terribly au fait with this world, but it did strike me as a pretty interesting case. Definitely historic, and it was very much Premier League driven. Well, I think, uh, I suppose when you think about it, right, like uh, anecdotally, you hear so many people, and this isn't a classic, I don't, like I don't, you hear me talking about their dodgy box and their various things, but like I'm maybe too old school in that regard. Like I don't know if a dodgy box is something you're paying for routinely or monthly or you just pay up front for your dodgy box and then hey presto I've, I've heard different versions from people but like what do you do <laughs> I, 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 I like recording stuff but then I, I mentioned to someone the other day they were like oh, I, I record on my uh, service I was like really okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I like I record lots of stuff so I just it would, for me that was never uh, an attraction or whatever so that's that would be my perspective on it but like what you do you do understand that like you know I mean if you want to watch all the games this is one of the things about the TV deal and in the UK and here like that you do like to, to watch all the Premier League games like there's a lot of various subscriptions you have to you have to sort of plug into um, and people always think about like look how, how football um, is funded like TV writes money and like, that's why you like you even have the, the Saudi and the Qatar stuff and the various issues in, in that world as well and there's also the piracy issues and you know you, you will see at the weekend you'll see a goal a clip is put up on social media and you maybe watch it and then it's gone within half an hour you know because it's, it's obviously a breach of copyright and people spend their whole time chasing up this but I suppose people the, the natural there's, there's a legal aspect to it but behind it all there's an element of football going well, we don't want to lose the value of our, of our TV rights here you know this is what this is what keeps the game going round but like it does feel like that horse is bolted spectacularly yeah sort of like protest, pro, you know prosecuting people for jaywalking I mean technically like 
you know technically within your rights to do so but you just know you're going to spend your you're going to waste a lot of police time going after this issue yes um but it is i mean you see this issues at times as well where like you hear the again the trails of the pub showing games illegally at three o'clock and you know they have to be gone after and it's like there's, there's, if you went down this road seriously you'd have to d- d- devote an entire the entire resources of a department to chasing this and to what end well Premier League might say we'll do it we'll fund it mm. I don't know were your ears uh, burning on Sunday afternoon Dan around half two because the paper review were discussing your piece in the Sunday Independent uh, you did I, to be fair lots of people have uh, done it over the last couple of days a quick recap on Irish players in the Premier League and you said that um Needless to say, Evan Ferguson, he is yeah. uh, very much the cherry on top of what is a charred cake, was your line. So only 12 players have qu- crossed the white line for a Premier League game this term. And of those 12 players, half made just a single figure number of appearances. Two have left since permanently. Another two spent the second half of the year on loan. As you said in your piece, to compare with the 90s or early 2000s, it's just such a different stratosphere. Yeah, the Premier time. League is now a different beast. But... The interesting comparison, perhaps, is a decade ago, consistently around 25 players, and that has dropped to half that number now, to give people your uh, ranking. And you got a bit squeamish about ranking when we got past number one, I think. <laughs> well, can I just say one thing to stop yeah. you? There was printed on Sunday afternoon, Cuevin Kelleher then played to become the 13th Irish player this year, because he hadn't played at the time of publication in the Premier League that year. So I don't know where he goes in be honest, live. Dan, it doesn't transform the picture. It doesn't. No, he goes in in the one appearance club with okay. several others. Come on, go, go for it. Uh, Evan Ferguson, we can gloss over that. Beautiful. Eight appearances and uh, more to follow next year Uh, number two of the success stories in Ireland Seamus Coleman 23 appearances I had no problem with that whatsoever because I felt he got an injury free run and he was back in very good form so I think you chalk that up as God Seamus Coleman really showed he can still no, he did. do he it did. then it starts to get a bit oh god there's healthy caveats and all these stories number three Nathan Collins now if we were talking in January Nathan Collins may well have been number one um, but Julian Lopetegui came in yeah. he said Craig Dawson you're my guy and so in effect up until maybe the last um, week or two of the season Collins has pretty much met an abrupt end to yeah he played the last two games team. he did play the last two games which is which is the end there is an encouraging end to that okay yeah. well, do you, so I suspect he'll stay for sure for another season oh well 100% uh, yeah like the one thing that you're guaranteed in the Premier League is you'll be sacked soon manager I just have to stick this out for a year or two and then maybe my face fits again. If oh, I wouldn't be worried about Collins at all. I actually wouldn't have... I'd have Under Lopetegui? Uh, no, I wouldn't be worried. Break back in? I think I think Lopetegui came in with a firefighting mission okay. to stay up. Um, I think there would be a view that Collins, like he's a record signing, he's the long-term guy. Yeah. Um, some speculation even around Kilman, who's the left-sided defender. Might he go? I don't even know if that's going to happen or not. Um, but he's an investment by the club. I just think Collins... I could play a lot of football he just had these uh, concentration issues in games or like there's a mistake lurking but on paper like he's one of these where like he's like he's been a, not a high player but the football people from the age of like 17, 18 like this guy's a player they can all see it I think people who train with him all see it it's just about ironing that out yeah. but I suspect a full pre-season at Wolves I, I'm actually not concerned about him at all okay. I have to say number four this is an interesting case to discuss. Gavin Bazunu, 32 appearances in a side uh, firmly relegated and he conceded a lot of goals and was put out of the team mm. as the season went on. And yet, what an invaluable experience for a 21-year-old yeah. in the Premier League. So 32 appearances, very tough season. Jamie Carragher certainly blamed him and pointed to XG and he is conceding more goals than he should. That may well be a valid criticism, I don't know. But uh, how will we remember this uh, season in Gavin Bazuna's career, do you think, in five years? Character building? Well, I, I mean, like to see the obvious answer to that is we'll see where he is in five years, and that will shape our conclusion. Yeah. Like, okay. we, if he's thriving, like, well, that was the making of him. And if, you, if for some reason he doesn't come back, is, is the Premier League so ruthless that they take a glance at that Carragher, big voice in the world of football, and maybe it's very damaging for Brazil? I don't think so. Okay. Either. And, I, and you know, I might kind of, I'm giving back to back like positive Irish answers here, yes, and I'm very your piece grimmed me out in this conversation. Yeah. No, I'm, this I sound like now I'm just like yes on this player. No, 
no, no, it's not as bad as it may seem. But I think there's parallels probably between Collins and Bazzino in the sense that, like, why do people keep picking Bazzino? Like, I think everyone can see the potential, the ability. He's got a great character. Um, I feel like, like, I feel like when Aaron Connolly came along, there was a real mixed views about Aaron Connolly because you'd, you'd hear the vibes of, I'm not sure if this fella's going to last the course, you know, and unfortunately, so it proved, you know, he's dropped off the map completely. Yeah. And there's one or two other players have come along with these concerns about, I don't think anyone would have those concerns about Collins. I wouldn't have those concerns about Bazunu. I think in terms of training ground and his mentality and his attitude, and I think the raw materials, like for all for all the the issues around Bazunu, mm. I never felt w- once alarmed when Ireland played France about Bazunu's presence, you know. Um, so I, I'd be in, now, uh, will he go into the championship and play a full season the next year with a team that's winning games as opposed to losing them most weeks? Could that be great for him? I mean, obviously he needs to be in the team at the start of the season, but I feel like he'll be, he will be okay. I, I think he'll be okay either way. Um, and it's, the, the, it's not really, the, I mean, that's my opinion, but I may be going a little bit more off the opinion of football people who, who can see, because you do have these players, you wonder about them at an early stage, but generally over the period of time, the people with the eye for the talent, they'll say I, it comes I think true. That's fair. I think 32 yeah. Premier League games, age 21, in a tough, sticky situation, will prove to be no bad thing. Where we start to feel bad about your list is after those four. Mm. Like number five, the Irish player with the fifth best Premier League season. In my opinion. Well, listen, Dan. I've I've done this every year for the last 14, 15 years, this ranking at the end of every season. So I always do it. You're a top dog. So, I mean, in your opinion, carries weight. Oh, yeah, yeah. Number five. That's that's my view, yeah. Yeah. Is Matt Doherty. Give me the counterpoint. <laughs> oh, I don't have one. <laughs> yeah. I just thought, oh God, are we? Well, at he, he did. Already? He did. Like he did play prior to Christmas. Prior to prior times. to be, prior to like, being tur- turfed out the door when Spurs realised, uh, oh no, he, crap, you know, loan rules and all this. Just need to get rid of Matt. Yeah. Like he was trusted to play in high enough quality Premier League games for Spurs at a certain level. Like I mean, he did score. I think he scored a goal in the season. I think he did. But he definitely like participated in the season. You know, in games where yeah there was a fair bit at stake and he wasn't getting 10 minutes off the bench at the end have so, we yeah. have we overrated Matt Doherty in this country um, well it depends when you're talking about I mean Matt Doherty at Wolves like was a really like was one of the form players in the Premier League yeah. in a team that like was perfectly suited to his system you know, look sorry don't get me wrong he was great but I just I feel and like it's not his fault has he been hyped up a bit too much you know as one of the best right backs in the league I don't know talked about. I always feel it's a lukewarm attitude towards him in this country to Do be you? honest yeah I think a lot of Ireland fans have been very critical of Matt Doherty at times okay. they don't like his sort of his style like, the you body know, language can look a touch yeah, so uh, I'm in third gear I don't think he's ever been a real hype player for our like I mean, the Doherty Coleman debate for example like should he be picked at various times it wasn't like yes there was times when Doherty the pendulum swung towards him he was in vogue and people said oh, you have to can't play Coleman you have to play Doherty but I don't know I don't feel like it, it was it's ever been ridiculously over the top okay. I, I, I'm, st- I'm standing open to correction what on that. does his future hold then uh, I would imagine he'll be playing in the Premier League next year again with a with a middle to lower tier Premier League side, that would be my. I've heard a bit of you know chat about that, but not something you would commit to print. Um, but I think like his Atletico move has been odd. I, I was wrong about that. I'll definitely say that. Like I I thought he would play more. I thought yes. it did appear. How, like, how much has he played now? Oh, like he's two sub appearances. It's been a disaster, really. Okay, so but it's been would, a pure Mendes. Would he be number play. one in your La Liga Republic? No, well, he's, he, well, yeah, the the the, the, the fella Getafe. I don't think played this year. Um, yeah, no, I, I like, that has been a disaster. I, I was wrong about that. Like, just on a, I was way too optimistic about that. I mean, that was clearly, but I, I did probably twig that it was clearly a Mendez play because he is represented by Jorge yeah. Mendez's company and it's like just two clubs that he has a relationship with and at the last minute there was a little bit of, oh, Spurs have hit their quota. We need to get Pedro Porro in. What can we do with Matt? And they've done a deal and that's what's happened. But they do have Molina at the World Cup winning right back there. Um, and maybe if he got injured or something it would have worked out great but uh, I have to admit now I, I don't want to read my piece about Doherty going there initially oh, I might dig it out and read it I wasn't honest. saying this is a wonderful moment in his career it was more saying it could work out I, well I don't think it was I, people were sort of laughing at the concept I was like no well, Matt Doherty playing for it like, isn't unreasonable like he's played for Spurs in the top six mm. he's entitled to go there it just seems like uh, the man 
manager that was there may not have particularly wanted him. Yeah. Which is an issue. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes why several successful managers at Spurs and I guess you've got to include it, let it go now, have just not been bowled over. But I, I do certainly feel at Wolves he was a player who was really benefiting from just that run of games and he's never had that since from the move to Spurs and I just don't feel he's on top of the ground as much or sharp looking. I think he's always looking like a player to me who, God, if he got another 10 games into him, he could really kick on. I feel like that's been the story of his time since he moved to Spurs. I, I dare say if he was super honest with himself and, and was to say, I, I, have I been as sharp? Have I been as as, as, as fit as, I've been, as I was at Wolves? I, I just don't see yeah. it. And even in his Irish performances, it's unfair to like pick one moment but I do think of like the way he threw a leg out at Hamden mm. against Scotland and I just like that that just speaks to someone who's not playing week in week out and, and in the uh, full of their fitness I suppose that's, yeah, I that's see what your I feel point. he is I see your point it's like Conte sort of came around to him eventually though like he actually did and then but then it just all happened so quickly about needing to get the Pedro Parra thing he in said, he said something interesting like he said the player from either a year or two ago is back yeah which with that I mean the other side of that coin is what's been going on for the last year or two yeah well he had I mean Conte had these legendary pre-seasons like when you think about it now you know, uh, sort of uh, tweets that didn't precede great events. Like, remember the great hype over the the Spurs players in Korea doing a mad preseason? They were vomiting. You know, and people wretched. vomiting, like you know, like the early stages of saving, saving Private Ryan or something. Yeah. Like, OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Have you subscribed? 